The history of the world is the history of the warfare between secret societies. Ishmael Reed, Mumbo Jumbo. It was the year when they finally immanentized the eschaton. On April the 1st, the world's great powers came closer to nuclear war than ever before. All because of an obscure island named Fernando Po. By the time international affairs returned to their normal Cold War level, some wits were calling it the most tasteless April Fool's joke in history. I happen to know all the details about what happened, but I have no idea how to recount them in a manner that will make sense to most readers. For instance, I'm not even sure who I am, and my embarrassment on that matter makes me wonder if you will believe anything I reveal. Worse yet, I am at the moment very conscious of a squirrel in Central Park, just off 68th Street in New York City, that is leaping from one tree to another, and I think that happens on the night of April the 23rd, or is it the morning of April the 24th? But fitting the squirrel together with Fernando Poo is, for the present, beyond my powers. I beg your tolerance. There is nothing I can do to make things any easier for any of us. And you will have to accept being addressed by a disembodied voice, just as I accept the compulsion to speak out, even though I am painfully aware that I am talking to an invisible, perhaps non-existent audience. Wise men have regarded the earth as a tragedy, a farce, even an illusionist trick. But all if they are truly wise and not merely intellectual rapists, recognize that it is certainly some kind of stage in which we all play roles, most of us being very poorly coached and totally unrehearsed before the curtain rises. Is it too much if I ask tentatively that we agree to look upon it as a circus? A touring carnival wandering about the sun for a record season of four billion years and producing new monsters and miracles, hoaxes and bloody mishaps, wonders and blunders, but never quite entertaining the customers well enough to prevent them from leaving one by one and returning to their homes for a long and bored winter's sleep under the dust. Then say, for a while at least, that I have found an identity as ringmaster. But that crown sits uneasily on my head, if I have a head. And I must warn you that the troop is small for a universe this size, and many of us have to double or triple our stints. So you can expect me back in many other guises. Indeed, do many things come to pass. The scene of the blast was one of those old office buildings with gothic and gingerbread styling all over the lobby floor. In the dim light of the hour, it reminded me of the shadowy atmosphere of Charlie Chan in the Wax Museum. And a smell hit my nostrils as soon as I walked in. A patrolman lounging inside the door snapped to attention when he recognized me. Took out the 17th floor and part of the 18th, he said. Also a pet shop here on the ground level. Some freak of dynamics. Nothing else is damaged down here, but every fish tank went. That's the smell. Barney Muldoon, an old friend with the look and mannerisms of a Hollywood cop, appeared out of the shadows. A tough man. And nowhere as dumb as he liked to pretend. Which is why he was head of the bomb squad. Your baby, Barney? I asked casually. Looks that way. Nobody killed. The car went out to you because a clothier's dummy was burned on the 18th floor and the first car here thought it was a human body. Wait. George Dawn is screaming. Saul's face showed no reaction to the answer. But poker players at the fraternal order of police had long ago given up trying to read that inscrutable Talmudic countenance. 
As Barney Muldoon, I knew how I would feel if I had the chance to drop this case on another department and hurry home to a beautiful bride like Rebecca Goodman. I smiled down at Saul. His height would keep him from appointment to the force now, but the rules were different when he was young. And I added quietly, There might be something in it for you, though. The fedora darked as Saul took out his pipe and started to fill it. All he said was, Oh, right now, I went on, we're just notifying missing poisons. But if what I'm afraid of is right, it'll end up on your desk after all. He struck a match and started puffing. Somebody missing at this hour might be found among the living in the morning, he said between drags. The match went out and shadows moved where nobody stirred. And he might not, in this case, Muldoon said. He's been gone three days now. An Irishman your size can't be any more subtle than an elephant, Saul said wearily. Stop tantalizing me. What do you got? The office that was hit, Muldoon explained, obviously happy to share the misery, was a magazine called Confrontation. It's a kind of left to center, so this was probably a right-wing job and not a left-wing one. But the interesting thing is, we couldn't reach the editor, Joseph Malik, at his home. And when we called one of the associate editors, what do you think he told us? Malik disappeared three days ago. His landlord confirms it. He's been trying to get a hold of Malik himself because there's a no pets rule there. And the other tenants are complaining about his dogs. So, if a man drops out of sight and then his office gets bombed, I kind of think the matter might come to the attention of the homicide department eventually, don't you? So grunted. Might and might not, he said. I'm going home. I'll check with missing persons in the morning, see what they got. The patrolman spoke up. You know what bothers me most about this? The Egyptian mouth breeders. The what? Saul asked. That pet shop. The patrolman explained, pointing to the other end of the lobby. I looked over the damage, and they had one of the best collections of rare tropical fish in New York City. Even Egyptian mouth breeders. He noticed the expressions on the faces of the two detectives and added lamely. If you don't collect fish, you wouldn't understand. But believe me, an Egyptian mouth breeder is pretty hard to get these days. And they're all dead in there. Mouth breeder? Muldoon asked incredulously. Yeah, you see, they keep their young in their mouths for a couple of days after birth, and they never, never swallow them. That's one of the great things about collecting fish. You get to appreciate the wonders of nature. Muldoon and Saul looked at each other. It's inspiring, Muldoon said finally. To have so many college graduates on the force these days. The elevator door opened, and Dan Pricefixer, a red-headed young detective on Muldoon's staff, emerged carrying a metal box. I think this is important, Barney. He began immediately with just a nod to Saul. Damned important. I found it in the rubble and had been partly blown open, so I looked inside. And? Muldoon prompted. It's the freakiest bunch of inner office memos I ever set eyes on. Weird as tits on a bishop. This is going to be a long night, Saul thought suddenly with a sinking feeling. A long night and a heavy case. Want a peek? Muldoon asked him maliciously. You better find a place to sit down. Price fixer volunteered. It'll take you a while to go through them. Let's use the cafeteria, Saul suggested. Saul removed his hat and ran a hand through his grey hair pensively as Muldoon read the first two memos in one quick scan. When they were passed over, he put on his glasses and read more slowly in his own methodical and thoughtful way. Hold onto your hats. This is what they said. Illuminati Project Memo 1 Seven stroke twenty three JM. The first reference I found is in Violence by Jacques Ellul, Seabury Press, New York, nineteen sixty nine. He says, pages eighteen to nineteen, that the illuminated ones were founded by Joachim of Floris in the eleventh century and originally taught a primitive Christian doctrine of poverty and equality, 
but later under the leadership of Fra Dolcino in the 15th century they became violent plundered the rich and announced the imminent reign of the spirit in 1507 he concludes they were vanquished by the forces of order that is an army commanded by the bishop of Vercoy he makes no mention of any Illuminati movement in earlier centuries or in more recent times I'll have more later today Pat P.S. I found a little more about Joachim of Floris in the back files of the National Review William Buckley and his cronies think Joachim is responsible for modern liberalism socialism and communism they've condemned him in fine theological language he committed the heresy they say of Immanentizing the Christian eschaton. Do you want me to look that up in a technical treatise on Thomism? I think it means bringing the end of the world closer, sort of. Illuminati Project Memo 2, 7 stroke 23, JM. My second source was more helpful. Akron Darrow, A History of Secret Societies, Citadel Press, New York, 1961. Darrow traces the Illuminati back to the 11th century also, but not to Joachim of Floris. He sees the origin in the Ishmaelian sect of Islam, also known as the Order of Assassins. They were vanquished in the 13th century but later made a comeback with a new, less violent philosophy and eventually became the Ishmaelian sect of today led by the Aga Khan. However, in the 16th century in Afghanistan, the illuminated ones, Roshinaya, picked up the original tactics of the Order of Assassins. They were wiped out by an alliance of the Mughals and Persians pages 220 to 223 but the beginning of the 17th century saw the foundation of the illuminated ones of Spain the Alambrados condemned by an edict of the Grand Inquisition in 1623 in 1654 the illuminated Guerinets came into public notice in France and finally the part you're most interested in the Bavarian Illuminati was founded on May Day, 1776, in Ingolstadt, Bavaria, by Adam Weishaupt, a former Jesuit. Documents still extant show several points of resemblance between the German and Central Asian Illuminists, points that are hard to account for on grounds of pure coincidence. Page 255. Weishaupt's Illuminati was suppressed by the Bavarian government in 1785. Doral also mentions the Illuminati of Paris in the 1880s, but suggests it was simply a passing fad. He does not accept the notion that the Illuminati still exists today. This is beginning to look big. Why are we keeping the details from George? Pat. Saw the Muldoon exchange glances. Let's see the next one, Saul said. He and Muldoon read together Illuminati Project Memo 3 7 stroke 24 JM The Encyclopedia Britannica has little to say on the subject 1966 edition volume 11 Halicatu Impala page 1094 Illuminati a short-lived movement of Republican free thought founded on May Day 1776 by Adam Weishaupt, professor of canon law at Ingolstadt and a former Jesuit. From 1778 onward, they began to make contact with various Masonic lodges, where, under the impulse of A. Knigger, Q.V., one of their chief converts, they often managed to gain a commanding position. The scheme itself had its attractions for literary men like Goethe and Herder, and even for the reigning dukes of Gothar and Weimar. The movement suffered from internal dissension and was ultimately banned by an edict of the Bavarian government in 1785. 
Pat. So paused. I'll make you a bet, Barney, he said quietly. The Joseph Malik who vanished is the J.M. these memos were written for. Sure, Muldoon replied scornfully. These Illuminati characters are still around and they got him. Honest to God, saw, he added. I appreciate the way your mind usually pole vaults ahead of the facts, but you can ride a hunch just so far when you're starting from nothing. We're not starting from nothing, so said softly. Here's what we've got to start with. One. He held up a finger. A building is bombed. Two. Another finger. An important executive disappeared three days before the bombing. Already there's an inference. Or two inferences. Somebody got him, or else he knew something was coming for him and he ducked out. Now, look at the memos. Point three. He held up another finger. A standard reference word. The Encyclopedia Britannica seems to be wrong about when the Illuminati came into existence. They say 18th century Germany. But the other memos trace it back to, let's see, Spain in the 17th century, France in the 17th century, and then in the 11th century back to Italy and halfway across the world to Afghanistan. So, we've got a second inference. If the Britannica is wrong about when the thing started, they may be wrong about when it ended. Now, put these three points and two inferences together, and the Illuminati got the editor and blew up his office. Nuts! I still say you're going too fast. Maybe I'm not going fast enough, so said. An organization that has existed for a couple of centuries minimum and kept its secrets pretty well hidden most of that time might be pretty strong by now. He trailed off into silence and closed his eyes to concentrate. After a moment, he looked at the younger man with a searching glance. Muldoon had been thinking too. I seen men land on the moon, he said. I seen students break into the administration offices and shit in the dean's wastebasket. I've even seen nuns in miniskirts. But this international conspiracy existing in secret for 800 years? It's like opening a door in your own house and finding James Bond and the President of the United States personally shooting it out with Fu Manchu and the five original Marx Brothers. Price Fixer stuck his head in the cafeteria door. Minute, he asked. What is it? Muldoon replied. Peter Jackson is out here. He told the associate editor I spoke to on the phone. He just told me something about his last meeting with Joseph Malik, the editor, before Malik disappeared. Bring him in, Muldoon said. Peter Jackson was a black man, truly black, not brown or tan. He was wearing a vest in spite of the spring weather. He was also very obviously wary of policemen. Saul noted this at once and began thinking about how to overcome it, and at the same time he observed an increased blandness in Muldoon's features, indicating that he too had noted it and was prepared to take umbrage. Have a seat, Saul said cordially. And tell us what you just told the other officer. With the nervous ones, it was sound policy to drop the policeman role at first and try to sound like somebody else, somebody who quite naturally asks a lot of questions. Saul began slipping into the personality of his own family physician, which he usually used at such times. He made himself feel a stethoscope hanging about his neck. Well, Jackson began in a Harvard accent. This is probably not important. It may be just a coincidence. Most of what we hear is just unimportant coincidence, Saul said gently. But it's our job to listen. Everybody but the lunatic fringe has given up on this by now, Jackson said. It really surprised me when Joe told me what he was getting the magazine into. He paused and studied the two impassive faces of the detectives. Finding little there, he went on reluctantly. It was last Friday. Joe told me he had a lead that interested him, and he was putting a staff writer on it. He wanted to reopen the investigation of the assassinations of Martin Luther King and the Kennedy brothers. Saul carefully didn't look at Muldoon, and just as carefully moved his hat to cover the memos on the table. 
Excuse me a moment, he said politely and left the cafeteria. He found a phone booth in the lobby and dialed his home. Peter Jackson looked up as he re-entered the cafeteria. An intelligent, curious black face. Muldoon was impassive as the faces on Mount Rushmore. Mad Dog, Texas was the town where Malik thought these assassins had their headquarters, Muldoon said. That's where the staff writer was sent. What was the staff writer's name? Saul asked. George Dorn, Muldoon said. He's a young kid who used to be an SDS, and he was once rather close to the weatherman faction. This is serious, Peter Jackson was thinking. Joe Malik wasn't on a paranoid trip at all. The non-committal expressions of Muldoon and Goodman did not deceive him at all. He had long ago learned the black art of surviving in a white world, which is the art of reading not what was on a face, but what is behind the face. The cops were worried and excited, like any hunters on the track of something both large and dangerous. Joe was right about the assassination plot, and his disappearance and the bombing were part of it. And that meant George Dawn was in danger too. And Peter liked George, even if he was a snotty kid in some ways and an annoying ass licker about the race thing like most young white radicals mad dog texas peter thought that sure sounds like a bad place to be in trouble almost fifty years before a habitual bank robber named harry pierpont approached a young convict in michigan city prison and asked him do you think there might be a true religion but why is George Dawn screaming while Saul Goodman is reading the memos?
soul is no longer human. He's a pig. All cops are pigs. Everything you've ever believed is probably a lie. The world is a dark, sinister, mysterious and totally frightening place. Can you digest all that quickly? Then, walk into the mind of George Dawn for the second time. Five hours before the explosion at confrontation. Four hours before on the clock. And suck on the joint. Suck hard and hold it down. One o'clock, two o'clock, three o'clock, rock. You are sprawled on a crummy bed in a run-down hotel, and a neon light outside is flashing pink and blue patterns into your room. Exhale slowly. Feel the hit of the weed, and see if the wallpaper looks any brighter yet, any less unintentional low camp. It's hot, Texas dry hot. And you push your long hair back from your forehead and haul out your diary, George Dawn. Because reading over what you wrote last sometimes helps you to learn what you're really getting into. As the neon splotches the page with pink and blue, read this. April 23. How do we know whether the universe is getting bigger? All the objects in it are getting smaller. You can't say that the universe is getting bigger in relation to anything outside it, because there isn't any outside for it to relate to. There isn't any outside. But if the universe doesn't have an outside, then it goes on forever. Yeah, but its inside doesn't go on forever. How oh, do you know it doesn't, shithead? You're just playing with words, man. No, I'm not. The universe is the inside without an outside. The sound made by one. There was a knock at the door. The fear came over George. Whenever he was high, the least little detail wrong in his world would bring the fear. Irresistible, uncontrollable. He held his breath, not to contain the smoke in his lungs, but because terror had paralysed the muscles in his chest. He dropped the little notebook in which he wrote his thoughts daily and clutched at his penis, a habitual gesture in moments of panic. The hand holding the roach drifted automatically over the hollowed-out copy of Sinclair Lewis's It Can't Happen Here, which lay beside him on the bed, and he dropped the half-inch twist of paper and marijuana on top of the plastic baggie full of green grains. Instantly, a brown, smouldering, dime-sized hole opened up on the bag and the pot near the coal started to smoke. Stupid, said George, as his thumb stabbed the smoking coal to crush it. And he drew back his lips in a grimace of pain. A short, fat man walked into the room. Law officer written in every mean line of his crafty little face. George shrank back and started to close. It can't happen here. Like lightning, three stiff concrete hard fingers drove into his forearm. He screamed. The book jumped out of his hand, spilling pot all over the bedspread. Don't touch that, said the fat man. An officer being here to gather it up for evidence. I went easy with that karate punch, otherwise you'd be nursing a compound fracture of the left arm in Mad Dog County Jail tonight. No right thinking doctor likely to have a mind to come out and treat you. Well, you got a warrant? George tried to sound defiant. Oh, you think you have cojones. The fat man's breath stank of bourbon and cheap cigars. Rabbit cojones. I've terrified you unto death, boy. And you know it and I know it, yet you find it in your heart to speak of warrants. Next, you want to see the American Civil Liberties Union. He pulled aside the jacket of an iridescent grey summer suit that might have been new in Heartbreak Hotel was the top of the hit parade. A silver five-pointed star decorated his pink shirt pocket, and a forty-five automatic stuck in his pants top dented the fat of his belly. That is all the law I need when dealing with your type and mad dog. Walk careful with me, son, or you won't have nothing to grab onto next time one of us pigs, as you choose to call us in your little articles, busts in on you. 
which is not likely to happen in the next 40 years while you rot and grow old in our state prison. He seemed immensely pleased with his own oratorical style, like one of Faulkner's characters. George thought, It is forbidden to dream again. We maim our joys or hide them. Horses are made of chromium steel, and little fat men shall ride them, he said. You can't hit me with forty years for possession, and grass is legal in most other states. This law is archaic and absurd. Shit and onions, boy. You got too much of the kill of wheat there to call it mere possession. I call it possession with intent to sell. And the laws of this state are stern, and they are just, and they are our laws. And we know what that weed can do. We remember the Alamo and Santa Ana's troops losing all fear because they was high on Rosa Maria, as they called it in those days. Get on your feet, and don't ask to talk to a lawyer, neither. Can I ask who you are? I am Sheriff Jim Cartwright, nemesis of all evil in Mad Dog and Mad Dog County. And I'm Tiny Tim, said George, immediately saying to himself, Shut the fuck up, you too goddamn high. And he went right on and said, well, Maybe your slide would have won if Davy Crockett and Jim Bowie had got stoned too. And by the way, Sheriff, how did you know you could catch me with pot? Usually an underground journalist would make it a point to be clean when he comes into this godforsaken part of the country. It wasn't telepathy that told you I had pot on me. Sheriff Cartwright slapped his thigh. Oh, but it was. It was telepathy. Now just what made you think it wasn't telepathy brought me here? <laughs> he laughed, seized George's arm in a grip of iron and pushed him towards the hotel room door. George felt a bottomless terror, as if the pit of hell were opening beneath his feet, and Sheriff Jim Cartwright were about to pitchfork him into the bubbling sulphur. And I must admit, that was more or less the case. The President's actual television broadcast was transmitted to the world at 10.30pm EST, March 31. The Russians and Chinese were given 24 hours to get out of Fernando Po, or the skies over Santa Isabel would begin raining nuclear missiles. This is darn serious, the chief executive said. And America will not shirk in its responsibility to the freedom-loving people of Fernando Po. The broadcast concluded at 11 p.m. EST, and within two minutes, people attempting to get reservations on trains, planes, buses, or carpools to Canada at virtually every telephone wire in the country overloaded. In Moscow, where it was ten the next morning, the Premier called a conference and said crisply, That character in Washington is a mental lunatic, and he means it. Get our men out of an endo pool right away, then find out who authorized sending them in there in the first place and transfer him to be supervisor of a hydroelectric works in Outer Mongolia. We don't have any men in Fernando pool. The Americans are imagining things again. Well, how the hell can we withdraw men if we don't have them there in the first place? The Premier demanded. I don't know. We've got 24 hours to figure that out, or... The Commissar quoted an old Russian proverb which means, roughly, that when the polar bear excrement interferes with the fan belts, the machinery overheats. Suppose we just announced that our troops are coming out, another commissar suggested. They can't say we're lying if they don't find any of our troops there afterward. No, they never believe anything we say. They want to be shown, the premier said thoughtfully. We will have to infiltrate some troops surreptitiously and then withdraw them with a lot of fanfare and publicity. That should do it. I'm afraid... It won't end the problem, another commissar said funereally. Our intelligence indicates that there are Chinese troops there. Unless Peking backs down, we're going to be caught in the middle when the bombs start flying and... He quoted a proverb about the man in the intersection when two manure trucks collide. Damn, the Premier said. What the blue blazes do the Chinese want with Fernando Pu? He was harassed, but still he spoke with authority. He was, in fact, characteristic of the best type of dominant male in the world at this time. 
He was 55 years old, tough, shrewd, unburdened by the complicated ethical ambiguities which puzzle intellectuals. The long ago decided that the world was a mean son of a bitch, in which only the most cunning and ruthless can survive. He was also as kind as was possible for one holding that ultra-Darwinian philosophy. And he genuinely loved children and dogs, unless they were on the site of something that had to be bombed in the national interest. He still retained some sense of humour, despite the burdens of his almost godly office. And although he had been impotent with his wife for nearly ten years now, he generally achieved orgasm in the mouth of a skilled prostitute within 1.5 minutes. He took amphetamine pet pills to keep going on his gruelling 20-hour day, with the result that his vision of the world was somewhat skewed in a paranoid direction, and he took tranquilizers to keep from worrying too much, with the result that his detachment sometimes bordered on schizophrenia. But most of the time, his innate shrewdness gave him a fingernail grip on reality. In short, he was much like the rulers of America and China. O O O O five was summoned to meet W in the headquarters of a certain branch of British intelligence. The date was March the 17th, but being English, neither Quadruple O five nor W gave a thought to Blessed St. Patrick. Instead, they spoke of Fernando Poo. The Yanks. W said crisply, are developing evidence that the Russians or the Chinese or both of them are behind this tequila in motto swine. Of course, even if that were true, it wouldn't matter a damn to Her Majesty's government. What do we care if a speck of an island that size turns red? But you know the Yanks, 00005. They're ready to go to war over it, although they haven't announced that publicly yet. My mission... O, 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 five, asked, the fault lines of cruelty about his mouth turning into a most engaging smile. Is to hop down to Fernando Poo and find out the real politics of this tequila motor bloke. And if he is red, overthrow him before the Yanks blow up the world. That's the assignment. We can't have a bloody nuclear war just when the balance of payments is almost straightened out and the common market is finally starting to work. So, hop to it straight away. Naturally, if you're captured, Her Majesty's government will have to disavow any knowledge of your actions. It always seems to work out that way, Quadruple O Five said ironically. I wish for once you'd give me a mission where Her Majesty's bleeding government would stand behind me in a tight spot. But Quadruple O Five, of course, was merely being witty. As a loyal subject, he would follow orders under any circumstances, even if it required the death of every soul on Fernando Poo, and himself as well. He rose in his characteristically debonair fashion and headed for his own office, where he began his preparations for the Fernando Poo mission. His first step was to check his personal worldwide travel notebook, seeking the bar in Santa Isabel, which came closest to serving a suitable martini, and the restaurant most likely to prepare an endurable lobster Newburg. To his horror, there was no such bar and no such restaurant. Santa Isabel was bereft of social graces. I say. 0005 muttered. Lush, it's going to be a bit thick. But he cheered up quickly, for he knew that Fernando Poo would be equipped at least with a bevy of tawny-skinned or coffee-coloured females, and such women were the holy grail to him. Besides, he had already formed his own theory about Fernando Poo. He was convinced that bugger, blowhards, unreformed gangsters, goons and espionage renegades, an international conspiracy of criminals and double agents, led by the infamous and mysterious Eric the Red Blowhard, was behind it all. 0005 had never heard of the Illuminati. In fact, 0005, despite his dark hair, combed straight back, his piercing eyes, his cruel and handsome face, his tram, athlete's body, and his capacity to penetrate any number of females and defenestrate any number of males in the course of duty, was not really an ideal intelligence agent. He had grown up reading Ian Fleming novels, and one day, at the age of 21, looked in the mirror 
decided he was everything a Fleming hero should be, and started a campaign to get into the spy game. After fourteen years in bureaucratic burrowing, he finally arrived in one of the intelligence services. But it was much more the kind of squalid and bumbling organisation in which Harry Palmer had toiled his cynical days away than it was a birth of bondage. Nevertheless, double o double o five did his best to refurbish and glamorise the scene, and perhaps because God looks after fools, he hadn't managed to get himself killed in any of the increasingly bizarre missions to which he was assigned. The missions were all weird at first because nobody took them seriously. They were all based on wild rumours that had to be checked out just in case there'd be some truth in them. But later it was realised that O O O O Five's peculiar schizophrenia was well suited to certain real problems, just as the schizoid of the more withdrawn type is ideal for a sleeper agent, since he could easily forget what was conventionally considered his real self. Of course, nobody at any time ever took bugger seriously, and behind his back, O O O O Five's obsession with this organisation was a subject of much interdepartmental humour. It is our duty, our sacred duty, to defend Fernando Poo. Atlanta Hope was telling a cheering crowd in Cincinnati that very day. Are we to wait until the godless Reds are right here in Cincinnati? <laughs> the crowd started to scream their unwillingness to wait that long. They had been expecting the godless Reds to arrive in Cincinnati since about 1945, and were by now convinced that the dirty cowards were never going to come, and would have to be met on their own turf. But a group of dirty, long-haired, freaky-looking students from Antioch College began to chant, "I don't want to die for Fernando Poe." The crowd turned in fury. At last, some real Reds to fight. Seven ambulances and thirty police cars were soon racing to the scene. But only five years earlier, Atlanta had a different message. When God's Lightning was first founded as a splinter off women's liberation. It has as its slogan "No more sexism," and its original targets were adult bookstores, sex education programs, men's magazines, and foreign movies. It was only after meeting smiling Jim Trepomina of Knights of Christianity United in Faith that Atlanta discovered that both male supremacy and orgasms were part of the international communist conspiracy. It was at that point, really. That God's lightning and Orthodox women's lib totally parted company, 
for the orthodox faction just then were teaching that male supremacy and orgasms were part of the international capitalist conspiracy. Fernando Poole. The President of the United States told reporters, even as Atlanta was calling for all-out war, will not become another Laos or another Costa Rica. When are we going to get our troops out of Laos? A reporter from the New York Times asked quickly. But a man from the Washington Post asked just as rapidly. And when are we going to get our troops out of Costa Rica? Our present plans for withdrawal are going forward according to an orderly schedule. The president began. But in Santa Isabel itself, as Tequila Remota underlined a passage in Machiavelli, Quadrupolo 5 concluded a shortwave broadcast to a British submarine lying 17 miles off the coast of the island. The Yanks have gone absolutely bonkers, I'm afraid. I've been here nine days now, and I'm absolutely convinced there is not one Russian or Chinese agent in any way involved in Generalissimo Tequila Emota, nor are there any troops of either of those governments hiding anywhere in the jungles. However, Bugger is definitely running a heroin smuggling ring here, and I would like permission to investigate that. The permission was to be denied. Old W, back at Intelligence HQ in London, knew that Quadrable 05 was a bit bonkers about Bugger himself, and imagined that it was involved in every mission he undertook. At the same time, in a different hotel, Tobias Knight, on special loan from the FBI to the CIA, concluded his nightly shortwave broadcast to an American submarine 23 miles off the coast. The Russian troops are definitely engaged in building what can only be a rocket launching site, and the slants are constructing what seems to be a nuclear installation. And Hagbar Chalene, lying 40 miles out in the Bight of Biafra in the Leif Erikson, intercepted both messages and smiled cynically and wired P in New York. Activate Malik and prepare Dawn. There are Swedish and Norwegian kids, Danes, Italians and French kids, Greeks, even Americans. George and Hagbard move through the crowd trying to estimate its number. 200,000, 300,000, 500,000. Peace symbols dangling about every neck. Nudes with body paint. Nudes without body paint. Long and dangling hair on boys and girls alike. And over all of it, the hypnotic and unending beat. Woodstock, you rober. Hagbard says dryly. The last and final Valpurgish act. And Adam Weishaupt's erosion finally realized. We're gonna rock, rock, rock till broad daylight. It's the League of Nations, George says. A young people's League of Nations. Agbard isn't listening. Up there, he points. To the northwest is the Rhine, where Di Lorelei was supposed to sit and sing her deadly songs. There'll be deadlier music on the Danube tonight. We're gonna rock around the clock tonight. But that was still seven days of the future. And now, George lies unconscious in Mad Dog County Jail. And it began, that phase of the operation, as Hagbard called it, over 30 years before, when a Swiss chemist named Hoffman climbed on his bicycle and pedaled down a country road into new dimensions. And will they all come back? George asked. All of them. Hagbard answered tightly. When the beat reaches the proper intensity, unless we can stop it. The universe is the inside without any outside, the sound made by one eye opening. In fact, I don't even know that there is a universe. More likely, there are many multiverses each with its own dimensions, times, spaces, laws, and eccentricities. We wander between and among these multiverses, trying to convince others and ourselves that we all walk together in a single public universe that we can share. For to deny that axiom leads to what is called schizophrenia. Yeah, that's it. Every man's skin is his own private multiverse. Just like every man's home is supposed to be his castle. But all the multiverses are trying to merge to create a true universe 
such as we have only imagined previously. Maybe it will be spiritual, like Zen or telepathy, or maybe it will be physical, one great big gang fuck. But it has to happen. The creation of a universe, and the one great eye opening to see itself at last. Om Shiva. Oh, man, you're stoned out of your gourd. You're writing gibberish. No, I'm writing with absolute clarity for the first time in my life. Yeah, what was that business about the universe being the sound of one eye opening? Oh, never mind that. Who the hell are you and how did you get into my head? Your turn now, George. Sheriff Cart writes to the door. A monk in a strange red and white robe beside him, holding some kind of wand, the deep colour of a fire engine. No, no. George started to stammer, but he knew. Of course you know, the sheriff said kindly, as if he was suddenly sorry about it all. You knew before you left New York and came down here. They were at the foot of the gallows. Each with its own time, spaces, laws, and eccentricities. George was thinking wildly. Yes, if the universe is one big eye looking at itself, then telepathy is no miracle. For anyone who opens his own eyes fully can then look through all other eyes. For a moment, George looks through the eyes of John Ehrlichman as Dick Nixon urges lewdly. You can say I don't remember. You can say I can't recall. I can't give any answer to that that I can recall. I can't give any answer to that that I can recall. All flesh will see it in one instant. Who wrote that? Gonna miss you, boy. The sheriff said, offering an embarrassed handshake. Numbly, George clasped the man's hot reptilian palm. The monk walked beside him up the gallows steps. Thirteen, George was thinking. There are always thirteen steps on a gallows. And you always cream in your jeans when your neck breaks. It has something to do with the pressure on the spinal cord being transmitted through the prostate gland. The orgasm death gimmick, Burroughs calls it. At the fifth step, the monk cried suddenly. Hail, Eris. George stared at the man, dumbfounded. Who was Eris? Somebody in Greek mythology, but somebody very important. It all depends on whether the fool has wisdom enough to repeat it. Quiet, idiot. He can hear us. I got some bad pot, George decided, and I'm still back on the hotel bed hallucinating all this. But he repeated uncertainly. Hail, Eris. Immediately, just like his one and only acid trip, dimension began to alter... The steps grew larger, steeper, ascending them seemed as perilous as climbing Mount Everest. The air was suddenly lit with reddish flame. Definitely, George thought, some weird and freaky pot. And then for some reason he looked upward. Each step was now higher than an ordinary building. He was near the bottom of a pyramidal skyscraper of thirteen colossal levels. And at the top, and at the top, and at the top... One enormous eye, a ruby and demonic orb of cold fire without mercy or pity or contempt. And it looked at him and into him and through him. George Dawn awoke screaming. He lay on the floor of his cell in Mad Dog County Jail. Terror tactics, he thought. They were out to break him, a task which was beginning to look easy but they were covering up the evidence as they went along. There was no light through the cell window. It was therefore still night. He hadn't slept, but merely fainted. George started with an old gimmick. A piece torn off the tail of his shirt gave him a writing tablet. The point of his shoelace became a temporary pen. His own saliva spat onto the polish of the shoes themselves, created a substitute ink. Laboriously, after a half hour... He had his message written. Whoever finds this $50 bill to call Joe Malik, New York City, and tell him George Dorn held without lawyer, Mad Dog County Jail. The message shouldn't land too close to the jail, so George began looking for a weighted object. 
In five minutes he decided on a spring from the bunk mattress. It took him seventeen minutes more to pry it loose. After the missile was hurled out the window, probably George knew to be found by somebody who would immediately turn it over to Sheriff Jim Cartwright, he began thinking of alternate plans. He found, however, that instead of devising schemes for escape or deliverance, his mind insisted on going off in an entirely different direction. The face of the monk from his dream pursued him. He had seen that face somewhere before, he knew, but where? Somehow the question was important. He began trying in earnest to recreate the face and identify it. James Joyce, H.P. Lovecraft, and a monk in a painting by Fra Angelico all came to mind. It was none of them, but it looked somehow a little like each of them. Suddenly, tired and discouraged, George slouched back on the bunk and let his hand lightly clutch his penis through his trousers. Heroes of fiction don't jack off when the going gets rough, he reminded himself. Well, hell, he wasn't a hero, and this wasn't fiction. Then the machine gun fire started. The machine gun suddenly stopped stuttering, and I thought I heard a voice cry, Ear wicker, bloom and craft. I've still got Joyce on my mind, I decided. Then the third explosion came, and I covered my head as parts of the ceiling began falling on me. A key suddenly clanked against his cell door. Looking up, I saw a young woman in a trench coat carrying a tommy gun and desperately trying one key after another in the lock. From somewhere else in the building, there came a fourth explosion. The woman grinned tensely at the sound. Commie motherfuckers, she muttered, still trying keys. Who the hell are you? I finally asked hoarsely. Never mind that now, she snapped. We've come to rescue you, isn't that enough? Before I could think of a reply, the door swung open. Quick, she said. This way.
Choices. One. It is all true, exactly as the memo suggests. Two. It is partly true and partly false. Three. It is all false, and there is no secret society that has endured from 1090 AD to the present. Well, it isn't all true. Mayor Daly never said Aviga Blumenkraft to Senator Ribikoff. Saul had read in the Washington Post a lip reader's translation of Daly's diatribe, and there was no German in it, although there was obscenity and anti-Semitism. The vice out Washington impersonation theory also had some flaws. In those days, before plastic surgery, such an undetected assumption of the identity of a well-known figure was especially hard to credit, despite the circumstantial evidence quoted in the memos. Two strong arguments against choice one. The memos are not all true. How about choice three? The Illuminati might not be a straight, unbroken line from the first recruit gathered by old Hassani Saba to the person who bombed confrontation. It might have died and lain dormant for a term, like the Ku Klux Klan between 1872 and 1915. And it might have gone through such breakups and resurrections more than once in eight centuries. But linkages of some sort, however tenuous, reached from the 11th century to the 20th, from the Near East to Europe and from Europe to America. Saul's dissatisfaction with official explanations of recent assassinations, the impossibility of making any rational sense out of current American foreign policy, and the fact that even historians who vehemently distrusted all conspiracy theories acknowledged the pivotal role of secret Masonic lodges in the French Revolution. All these added weight to the rejection of choice three. Besides, the Masons were the first group, according to at least two of the memos, infiltrated by Weishaupt. Choice one is definitely out, then. And choice three, almost certainly equally invalid. Choice two, therefore, is most probably correct. The theory in the memos is partly true and partly false. But what, in essence, is the theory? And which part of it is true? Which part false? Saul lit his pipe, closed his eyes, and concentrated. The theory, in essence, was that the Illuminati recruited people through various fronts, turned them onto some sort of illuminizing experience through marijuana, or some special extract of marijuana, and converted them into fanatics willing to use any means necessary to illuminize the rest of the world. Their aim, obviously, is nothing less than the total transformation of humanity itself, along the lines suggested by the film 2001, or by Nietzsche's concept of the Superman. In the course of this conspiracy, the Illuminati, according to Malik's hints to Jackson, were systematically assassinating every popular political figure who might interfere with their program. Saul thought suddenly of Charlie Manson and of the glorification of Manson by the weatherman and Morituri bombers. And he thought of the popularity of pot smoking and of the slogan, by any means necessary, with contemporary radical youth even outside weatherman. And he thought of Nietzsche's slogans, be hard. Whatever is done for love is beyond good and evil. Above the ape is man, and above man the superman. Forget not thy whip. In spite of his own logic, which had proved that Malik's theory was only partly true, Saul Goodman, a lifelong liberal, suddenly felt a pang of typically right-wing terror toward modern youth. He reminded himself that Malik seemed to think the conspiracy emanated chiefly from Mad Dog. And that was God's lightning country down there. God's lightning had no fondness for marijuana or for youth or for the definitely anti-Christian overtones of the Illuminati philosophy. 
Besides, Malik's sources were only partly trustworthy, and there were other possibilities. The Shriners, for instance, were part of the Masonic movement, were generally right-wing, had their own hidden rites and secrets, and used Arabic trappings that might well derive from Hassani Saba or the Roshinaya of Afghanistan. Who could say what secret plots were hatched at Shriner conventions? No, nah. that was the intuitive pole vaulter in the right lobe at work again. And right now, Saul was concerned with the plodding logician in the left lobe. The key to the mystery was in getting a clearer definition of the purpose of the Illuminati. Identify the change they were trying to accomplish in man and in his society, and then you would be able to guess, at least approximately, who they were. Their aim was English domination of the world, and they were road scholars, according to the Birchers. That idea obviously belonged with Saul's own whimsy about a worldwide Shriner conspiracy. What then? The Italian Illuminati under Fra Dolcino wanted to redistribute the wealth, but the international bankers mentioned in the Playboy letter presumably wanted to hold on to their wealth. Weishaupt was a free thinker, according to the Britannica, and so were Washington and Jefferson. But Saba and Joachim of Florence were evidently heretical mystics of the Islamic and Catholic traditions, respectively. So picked up the ninth memo, deciding to get more facts or pretended facts before analysing further. And then it hit him. Whatever the Illuminati were aiming at had not been accomplished. Proof. If it had, they would not still be conspiring in secret. Since almost everything has been tried in the course of human history, find out what hasn't been tried, at least not on a large scale. And that will be the condition to which the Illuminati are trying to move the rest of mankind. Capitalism had been tried. Communism had been tried. Even Henry George's single tax has been tried in Australia. Fascism, feudalism, mysticism have been tried. Anarchism has never been tried. Anarchism was frequently associated with assassinations. It had an appeal for free thinkers, such as Kropotkin and Bakunin, but also for religious idealists like Tolstoy and Dorothy Day of the Catholic Worker Movement. Most anarchists hoped Joachim like to redistribute the wealth. But Rebecca had once told him about a classic of anarchist literature, Max Stirner's The Ego and His Own, which had been called the billionaire's Bible, because it stressed the advantages the rugged individualist would gain in a stateless society. And Cecil Rhodes was an adventurer before he was a banker. The Illuminati were anarchists. It all fit. The pieces of the puzzle slipped together smoothly. Saul was convinced. He was also wrong. The second trip, or Chokmar, Hopalong Horus rides again. Hang on for some metaphysics. The anaristic principle is that of order. The eristic principle is that of disorder. On the surface, the universe seems, to the ignorant, to be ordered. This is the anaristic illusion. Actually, what order is there is imposed on primal chaos in the same sense that a person's name is draped over his actual self. It is the job of the scientist, for example, to implement this principle in a practical manner, and some are quite brilliant at it. But on closer examination, order dissolves into disorder, which is the heuristic illusion. Malaclips the Younger, KSC, Principia Discordia. In Chicago, 
Simon Moon was listening to the birds begin to sing and waiting for the first cinnamon rays of dawn as Mary Lou Cervix slept beside him. His mind was active, thinking about pyramids and rain gods and sexual yoga and fifth-dimensional geometries, but thinking mostly about the Ingolstadt Rock Festival and wondering if it would all happen as Hagbard Chalene had predicted. Two blocks north in space and over forty years back in time, Simon's mother heard pistol shots as she left Wobbly Hall. Simon was a second generation anarchist and followed the crowd to gather in front of the Biograph Theatre where a man lay bleeding to death in the alley. And the next morning, July 23rd, 1934, Billy Freshette, in her cell at Cook County Jail, got the news from a matron. In this white man's country, I am the lowliest of the lowly, subjugated because I am not white, and subjugated again because I am not male. I am the embodiment of all that is rejected and scorned, the female, the coloured, the tribe, the earth, all that has no place in this world of white male technology. I am the tree that is cut down to make room for the factory that poisons the air. I am the river filled with sewage. I am the body that the mind despises. I am the lowliest of the lowly, the mud beneath your feet. And yet, of all the world, John Dillinger picked me to be his bride. He plunged within me into the very depths of me. I was his bride, not as your wise men and churches and governments know marriage, but we were truly wed. As the tree is wed to the earth, the mountain to the sky, the sun to the moon. I held his head to my breast and tousled his hair, as if it were sweet as fresh grass, and I called him Johnny. He was more than a man, he was mad but not mad, not as a man may go mad when he leaves his tribe and lives among hostile strangers, and is mistreated and scorned. He was not mad as all other white men are mad, because they have never known a tribe. He was mad as a god might be mad. And now they tell me he is dead. Simon! in fact had what can be called a funky education. I mean, man, when your parents are both anarchists, the Chicago public school system is going to do your head absolutely no good at all. Feature me in a 1956 classroom with Eisenhower's Moby Dick face on one wall and Nixon's Captain Ahab glare on the other and in between standing in front of the inevitable American rag Miss Doris Day or her elder sister telling the class to take home a leaflet explaining to their parents why it's important for them to vote. My parents don't vote, I say. Well... This leaflet will explain to them why they should, she tells me with a real authentic Doris Day sunshine and Kansas cornball smile. It's early in the term and she hasn't heard about me from the last semester teacher. I really don't think so, I say politely. They don't think it makes any difference whether Eisenhower or Stevenson is in the White House. They say the orders will still come from Wall Street. It's like a thundercloud. All the sunshine goes away. They never prepared her for this in the school where they turn out all these Doris Day replicas. The wisdom of the fathers is being questioned. She opens her mouth and closes it and opens and closes it and finally takes such a deep breath that every boy in the room, we're all on the cusp of puberty, gets a hard-on from watching her breasts heave up and slide down again. I mean, they're all praying, except me, I'm an atheist, of course, that they won't get called on to stand up. If it wouldn't attract attention, they'd be clubbing their dicks down with their geography books. That's the wonderful thing about this country. She finally gets out. Even people with opinions like that can say what they want without going to jail. You must be nuts, I say. My dad's been in and out of jail so many times, they should put in a special revolving door just for him. My mom, too. You ought to go out with subversive leaflets in this town and see what happens. 
Now, of course, after school, a gang of patriots, with the odds around seven to one, beat the shit out of me and make me kiss their red, white and blue totem. It's no better at home. Mum's an anarcho-pacifist, Tolstoy and all that, and she wants me to say I didn't fight back. Dad's a wobbly and wants to be sure that I have hurt some of them at least, and at least as bad as they hurt me. After they yell at me for a half hour, they yell at each other for two. Bakunin said this, and Kropotkin said that, and Gandhi said the other, and Martin Luther King is the saviour of America, and Martin Luther King is a bloody fool who's selling his people an opium utopia and all that jive. Go down to Wobbly Hall or Solidarity Bookstore and you'll still hear the same debate. Doubled, redoubled, in spades and vulnerable. So naturally I start hanging out on Wall Street and smoking dope and pretty soon I'm the youngest living member of what they call the Beat Generation. Which has not improved my relations with school authorities. But at least it's a relief from all that patriotism and anarchism. By the time I'm 17... And they shot Kennedy and the country starts coming apart at the seams. We're not beatniks anymore, we're hippies. And the thing to do is to go to Mississippi. Did you ever go to Mississippi? You know what Dr Johnson said about Scotland? The best thing you can say for it is that God created it for some purpose. The same is true of hell. I got stoned one night and went home to see what it would be like relating to Mum and Dad in that condition. It was the same, but different. Tolstoy coming out of her mouth, Bakunin coming out of his. And it was suddenly all weird and super freaky, like Goddard shooting a Kafka scene. Two dead Russians debating with each other long after they were dead and buried, out of the mouths of a pair of Chicago Irish radicals. The young frontal lobe type anarchists in the city were in their first surrealist revival just then. And I'd been reading some of their stuff. And it clicked. You're both wrong, I said. Freedom won't come through love. It won't come through force. It will come through the imagination. Mm. I put in all the capital letters. And I was so stoned that they got contact high and heard them too. Their mouths dropped open, and I felt like William Blake telling Tom Paine where it was really at. A night of magic waving my wand and dispersing the shadows of Maya. Dad was the first to recover. Imagination, he said, his big red face crinkling in that grin that always drove the cops crazy when they were arresting him. That's what comes to sending good working-class boys to rich people's colleges. Words and books get all mixed up with reality in their heads. When you were in that jail in Mississippi, you imagined yourself through the walls, didn't you? How many times an hour did you imagine yourself through the walls? I can guess. The first time I was arrested during the GE strike of 33, I walked through those walls a million times. But every time I opened my eyes, the walls and the bars were still there. What got me out finally? What got you out of Biloxi finally? Organization. If you want big words to talk to intellectuals with, that's a fine big word, son. Just as many syllables as imagination, and it has a lot more realism in it. That's what I remember best about him, that one speech and the strange clear blue of his eyes. He died that year, and I found out that there was more to the imagination than I had known. For he didn't die at all. He's still around, in the back of my skull, somewhere, arguing with me, and that's the truth. It's also the truth that he's dead, really dead, and part of me was buried with him. It's uncool to love your father these days. I, I didn't even know that I loved him until they closed the coffin, and I heard myself sobbing. And it comes back again, that same emptiness, whenever I hear Joe Hill. The copper bosses killed you, Joe. I never died, said he. Both lines are true, and mourning never ends. They didn't shoot Dad the clean way like Joe Hill, but they ground him down year after year, burning out his wob fires. And he was Aries, a real fire sign, with their cops, their courts, their jails and their taxes, their corporations, their cages for the spirit and cemeteries for the soul, their plastic liberalism and murderous Marxism. And even as I say that, I have to pay a debt to Lenin 
for he gave me the words to express how I felt when Dad was gone. Revolutionaries, he said, are dead men on furlough. The Democratic Convention of 68 was coming, and I knew that my own furlough might be much shorter than Dad's because I was ready to fight them in the streets. All spring, Mum was busy at the Women for Peace Centre, and I was busy conspiring with surrealists and yippies. And then I met Mao Tzu Hasi. It was April the 30th. Valpurgis knocked. Pause for thunder on the soundtrack. And I was rapping with some of the crowd at the Friendly Stranger. H.P. Lovecraft, the rock group, not the writer, was conducting services in the back room, pounding away at the door to Acid Land in the gallant effort, new and striking that year, to break in on waves of sound without any chemical skeleton key at all. I kept catching this uniquely pensive oriental face at the next table, but my own gang, including the weird faggot priest we nicknamed Padre Pederastia, had most of my attention. I was laying it on them heavy. It was my Donatian Alphonse Francois de Sade period. The head trip anarchists are as constipated as the Marxist. I was giving forth. You recognize the style by now. Who speaks for the thalamus, the glands, the cells of the organism? Who sees the organism? We cover it with clothes to hide its apehood. We won't have liberated ourselves from servitude until people throw all their clothes in the closet in spring and don't take them out again until winter. We won't be human beings the way apes are apes and dogs are dogs until we fuck where and when we want to, like any other mammal. Fucking in the streets isn't just a tactic to blow minds. It's recapturing our own bodies. Anything less... And we're still robots possessing the wisdom of the straight line, but not the understanding of the organic curve. And so on, and so forth. I think I found a few good arguments for rape and murder while I was at it. The next step beyond anarchy, somebody said cynically. Real chaos! Why not? I demanded. Who works at a straight job here? None of them did, of course. I deal dope myself. Will you work at a straight job for something that calls itself an anarchist syndicate? Will you run an engine lathe eight unfucking hours a day because the syndicate tells you the people need what the lathe produces? If you will, the people just becomes a new tyrant. To hell with machines! Kevin Cool, the poet, said enthusiastically. Back to the caves. He was as stoned as me. The oriental face leaned over. She was wearing a strange headband with a golden apple inside a pentagon. Her black eyes somehow reminded me of my father's blue eyes. What you want is an organization of the imagination? She asked politely. I flipped. It was too much hearing those words just then. A man at the Vandanta Society told me that John Dillinger walked through the walls... When he made his escape from Crown Point Jail... Miss Mao went on in a level tone. Do you think that is possible? What the fuck are you talking about? I asked, wondering if I was in some crazy surrealist movie, wandering from telepathic sheriffs to homosexual assassins to nympho lady masons to psychotic pirates, according to a script written in advance by two acid heads and a Martian humorist. I'm talking about adventure, George. I'm talking about seeing things and being with people that will really liberate your mind, not just replacing liberalism with Marxism so you can shock your parents. I'm talking about getting all together off the grubby plane you live on and taking a trip with Hagbard to a transcendental universe. Did you know that on sunken Atlantis there is a pyramidal structure built by ancient priests and faced with a ceramic substance that has withstood 30,000 years of ocean burial so that the pyramid is clean and white as polished ivory, except for the giant red mosaic of an eye at its top? I find it hard to believe that Atlantis ever existed, I said. In fact, I shook my head angrily. You're conning me into qualifying that. 
The fact is, I simply don't believe Atlantis ever existed. This is pure bullshit. Atlantis is where you're going next, friend. Do you trust the evidence of your senses? I hope so. Because you'll see Atlantis and the pyramid just as I said. Those bastards, the Illuminati, are trying to get gold to further their conspiracies by looting an Atlantean temple. An Agbard is going to foil them by robbing it first. Because I fight the Illuminati every chance I get, and because I'm an amateur archaeologist. Will you join us? You're free to leave right now if you wish. I'll put you ashore and even supply you with money to get back to New York. I shook my head. I'm a writer. I write magazine articles for a living. And even if 90% of what you say is bullshit moonshine and the most elaborate put-on since Richard Nixon, this is the best story I've ever come across. A nut with a gigantic golden submarine whose followers include beautiful gorilla women who blow up southern jails and take out the prisoners? Oh, no, I'm not leaving. You're too big a fish to let get away. Agvangeline slapped me on the shoulder. Good man. You've got courage and initiative. You trust only the evidence of your eyes and believe what no man tells you. I was right about you. Come on down to my stateroom. Wait till you see my suite. You'll like your stateroom, too. To please myself, I built this thing on a grand scale. No finicky naval architects or parsimonious accountants in my business. I believe you gotta spend money to make money, and to spend the money you make to enjoy money. Besides, I have to live in the damn thing. And what precisely is your business, Mr. Chilene? I asked. Or should I call you Captain Chilene? You should certainly not. No bullshit authority titles for me. I'm Freeman Hadbar Chilene, but the conventional mister is good enough. I prefer you call me by my first name. Hell, call me anything you want to. If I don't like it, I'll punch you in the nose. If there were more bloody noses, there'd be fewer wars. I'm in smuggling, mostly with a spot of piracy just to keep ourselves on our toes, but that only against the Illuminati and their communist dupes. We aim to prove that no state has the right to regulate commerce in any way, nor can it when it's up against free men. My crew are all volunteers. We have among us liberated sailors who were indentured to the navies of America, Russia, and China. <laughs> Excellent fellows. The governments of the world will never catch us because free men are always cleverer than slaves, and any man who works for a government is a slave. Then you're a gang of objectivists, basically. I've got to warn you, I come from a long line of labor agitators and reds. You'll never convert me to a right-wing position. Chilean roared back as if I'd waved awful under his nose. Objectivists? He pronounced the word as if I had accused him of being a child molester. We're anarchists and outlaws, goddammit. Didn't you understand that much? We've got nothing to do with right-wing, left-wing, or any other half-ass political category. If you work within the system, you come to one of the either-or choices that were implicit in the system from the beginning. You're talking like a medieval serf, asking the first agnostic whether he worships God or the devil. We're outside the system's categories. You'll never get the hang of our game if you keep thinking in flat-earth imagery of right, left, good and evil, up and down. If you need a group label for us, we're political non-Euclidians. But even that's not true. Sink me, nobody of this tub agrees with anybody else about anything, except maybe what the fellow with the horns told the old man in the clouds. Non serviam. And in Mad Dog, Jim Cartwright said into a phone with a scrambler device to evade taps. We let Chilene's crowd take Dorn according to plan. Good, said Atlanta Hope. The four are heading for Ingolstadt. Everything is go. She hung up and dialed again at once, reaching Western Union. 
I want a flat rate telegram, same words, 23 different addresses. She said crisply. The message is, insert the advertisement in tomorrow's newspapers. Signature, Atlanta Hope. She then read off the 23 addresses, each located in a large city in the United States, each a regional headquarters of God's lightning. The plot, accordingly, thickened. Brother Berghard, who's actually a politician in Chicago under his real name, once explained the law of fives to me in relation to the pyramid of power principle. Intellectually, I understand. It's the only way we can work, each group a separate vector, so that the most any infiltrator can learn is a small part of the design. Emotionally, though, it does get frightening at times. Do the five at the top really have the whole picture? I don't know. And I don't see how they can predict a man like Drake. Or guess what he's planning next? There's a paradox here, I know. I joined the order seeking power. And now I'm more a tool, an object than ever before. If a man like Drake ever thought that, he might tear the whole show apart. Unless the five really do have the powers they claim, but are not gullible enough to believe that bull. Some of it's hypnotism and some is plain old stage magic, but none of it is really supernatural. Nobody has sold me on a fairy tale since my uncle got into me when I was twelve with his routine about stopping the bleeding. The purple sage cursed and waxed sorely pissed and cried out in a loud voice, A pox upon the accursed Illuminati of Bavaria! May their seed take no root! May their hands tremble, their eyes dim, and their spines curl up, yea, verily! like unto the backs of snails. And may the vaginal orifices of their women be clogged with brillo pads. For they have sinned against God and nature. They have made of life a prison. And they have stolen the green from the grass and the blue from the sky. And so saying and grimacing and groaning, the purple sage left the world of men and women and retired to the desert in despair and heavy grumpiness. But the high chaparral laughed, and said to the Erysian faithful, Our brother torments himself with no cause, for even the malign Illuminati are unconscious pawns of the divine plane of Our Lady. Mordecai Malignatus K.N.S. The Book of Contradictions Liber Five five five. October the twenty third, nineteen seventy, was the thirty fifth anniversary of the murder of Arthur Flagenheimer, alias the Dutchman, alias Dutch Schultz. But this dreary lot has no intention of commemorating that occasion. They are the Knights of Christianity United in Faith. The group in Atlantis were called. Mouths of Luhav Kiraft, united for the truth, you see what I mean. And their president, James J. Smiling Jim Treponema, has noted a bearded and therefore suspicious young man among the delegates. Such types were not likely to be KCUF members and might even be dope fiends. Smiling Jim told the Andy Frayne ushers, to keep a watchful eye on the young man, so no funny business could occur, and then went to the podium to begin his talk on sex education, communist Trojan horse in our schools. In Atlantis, it was numbers, nothing Aryan squid trap in our schools. The same drivel eternally. The bearded young man, who happened to be Simon Moon, advisor to Teen Set magazine on Illuminati affairs and instructor in sexual yoga to numerous black young ladies, observed that he was being observed, which made him think of Heisenberg, and settled back in his chair to doodle pentagons on his notepad. In Central Park, Perry the Squirrel is beginning to hunt for the day's food. A French poodle 
held on a leash by a mink-coated lady, barks at him, and he runs three times round a tree. Padre Pederastia was, as on the night Simon met Miss Mao, very serious, and hardly camping at all. We have an alliance with them? Simon asked. The jams can't do it alone. Yes, we have an alliance, as long as it profits both parties. John, Mr. Sullivan himself, authorized this. Okay, what do they call themselves? The LDD. The Padre permitted himself a smile. New members are told the initials stand for Legion of Dynamic Discord. Later on, quite often, the leader, a most fetching scoundrel and madman named Chalene, sometimes tells them it really stands for little deluded dupes. That's the Pan's Asinorum, or an early Pan's Asinorum in Chalene's system. He judges them by how they react to that. Chilean's system? Simon asked warily. It leads to the same destination as ours, more or less, by a somewhat wilder and woollier path. They rely on Discordia. Do you remember your Roman myths? They're part of the Arisian Liberation Front, then. Simon is beginning to wish he was stoned. These conspiratorial conversations always made more sense when he was slightly high. No, the priest said flatly. Don't ever make that mistake. ELF is much more, um, esoteric outfit than the LDD. Chalene is on the activist side, like us. Some of his capers make Maritori or God's Lightning look like Trappists by comparison. No, ELF will never get on Mr. Chalene's trip. He's got an absurdist yoga and an activist ethic, Simon reflected. The two don't mix. Chalene is a walking contradiction. Look at his symbol again. I've been looking at it, and that Pentagon worries me. Are you sure he's on our side? We're never sure anybody is on our side. Uncertainty is the name of the game. A property is theft, Agbard said, passing the peace pipe. If the BIA helps those real estate developers take our land, Uncle John Feather said, that will be theft. But if we keep the land, that is certainly not theft. Night was falling in the Mohawk reservation, but Hagbold saw Sam Three Arrows nod vigorously in the gloom of the small cabin. He felt again that American Indians were the hardest people in the world to understand. His tutors had given him a cosmopolitan education, in every sense of the word, and he usually found no blocks in relating to people of any culture. But the Indians did puzzle him at times. After five years of specialising in handling the legal battles of various tribes against the Bureau of Indian Affairs and the land pirates it served, he was still conscious that these people's heads were some place he couldn't yet reach. Either they were the simplest or the most sophisticated society on the planet. Maybe, he thought, they were both. And the ultimate simplicity and the ultimate sophistication are identical. Property is liberty, Hagbard said. I am quoting the same man who said property is theft. He also said property is impossible. I speak from the heart. I wish you to understand why I take this case. 
I wish you to understand in fullness. Sam three arrows drew on the pipe, then raised his dark eyes to Hagbard's. You mean that justice is not known like a dog who barks in the night? That is more like the unexpected sound in the woods that must be identified cautiously after hard thinking. There it was again. Hagbard had heard the same concreteness of imagery in the speech of the Shoshone at the opposite end of the continent. He wondered idly if Ezra Pound's poetry might have been influenced by habits of speech his father acquired from the Indians. Homer Pound had been the first white man born in Idaho. It certainly went beyond the Chinese, and it came not from books on rhetoric, but from listening to the heart, the Indian metaphor he had himself used a minute ago. He took his time about answering. He was beginning to acquire the Indian habit of thinking a long while before speaking. Property and justice are water, he said finally. No man can hold them. I have spent many years in courtrooms, and I have seen property and justice change when a man speaks, change as the caterpillar changes to the butterfly. Do you understand me? I thought I had victory in my hands. And then the judge spoke, and it went away, like water running through the fingers. Uncle John Feather nodded. I understand. You mean we will lose again? We are accustomed to losing. Since George Washington promised us these lands, as long as the mountain stands and the grass is green, and then broke his promise and stole part of them back in ten years. In ten years, my friend, we have lost, always lost. We have one acre left of each hundred promised to us then. We may not lose, Agbard said. I promise you, the BIA will at least know that they have been in a fight this time. I learn more tricks and get nastier each time I go into a courtroom. I am a very tricky and very nasty person by now. But I am less sure of myself than I was when I took my first case. I no longer understand what I am fighting. I have a word for it. The snafu principle, I call it. But I do not understand what it is. There was another pause. Hagbard heard the lid on the garbage can in back of the cabin rattling. That was the raccoon that Uncle John Feather called Old Grandfather, come to steal his evening dinner. Property was theft, certainly in Old Grandfather's world, Hagbard thought. I am also puzzled, Sam Three Arrows said finally. I worked long ago in New York City in construction like many young men of the Mohawk Nation. I found that whites were often like us, and I could not hate them, one at a time. But they do not know the earth or love it. They do not speak from the heart, usually. They do not act from the heart. They are more like the actors on a movie screen. They play roles, and their leaders are not like our leaders. They are not chosen for virtue, but for their skill at playing roles. Whites have told me this in plain words. They do not trust their leaders, yet they follow them. When we do not trust a leader, he is finished. Then, also, the leaders of the whites have too much power. It is bad for a man to be obeyed too often. But the worst thing is what I have said about the heart. Their leaders have lost it, and they have lost mercy. They speak from somewhere else. They act from somewhere else. But from where? Like you, I do not know. It is, I think, a kind of insanity. He looked at Hagbard and added politely, Some are different. It was a long speech for him, and it stirred something in Uncle John Feather. I was in the army, he said. We went to fight a bad white man, or so the whites told us. We had meetings that were called orientation and education. There were films. It was to show us how this bad white man was doing terrible things in his country. 
Everybody was angry after the films and eager to fight. Except me. I was only there because the army paid more than an Indian can earn anywhere else. So I was not angry, but puzzled. There was nothing that this white leader did that the white leaders in this country do not also do. They told us about a place named Lidacy. It was much like Wounded Knee. They told us of families moved thousands of miles to be destroyed. It was much like the Trail of Tears. They told us of how this man ruled his nation so that none dared disobey him. It was much like the way white men work in corporations in New York City, as Sam has described it to me. I asked another soldier about this, a black white man. He was easier to talk to than the regular white man. I asked him what he thought of the orientation and education. He said it was shit, and he spoke from the heart. I thought about it a long time, and I knew he was right. The orientation and education was shit. When the men from the BIA come here to talk, it is the same. Shit. But let me tell you this. The Mohawk Nation is losing its soul. Soul is not like breath or blood or bone, and it can be taken in ways no man understands. My grandfather had more soul than I have, and the young men have less than me. But I have enough soul to talk to old grandfather, who is a raccoon now. He thinks as a raccoon, and he is worried about the raccoon nation, more than I am worried about the Mohawk nation. He thinks the raccoon nation will die soon, and all the nations of the free and wild animals. That is a terrible thing, and it frightens me. When the nations of the animals die, the earth will also die. That is an old teaching, and I cannot doubt it. I see it happening already. If they steal more of our land to build that dam, more of our soul will die, and more of the souls of the animals will die. The earth will die, and the stars will no longer shine. The great mother herself may die. The old man was crying unashamedly. And it will be because men do not speak words, but speak shit. Agbard had turned pale beneath his olive skin. You're coming into court, he said slowly. And you're going to tell the judge that in exactly those words. Illuminati Project Memo 10, 7 stroke 28, JM. On the origin of the pyramid and eye symbol, test your credulity on the following yarn from Flying Saucers in the Bible by Virginia Brassington, Saucerian Books, 1963, page 43. The Continental Congress had asked Benjamin Franklin, Thomas Jefferson and John Adams to arrange for a seal for the United States of America. None of the designs they created or which were submitted to them were suitable. Fairly late at night, after working on the project all day, Jefferson walked out into the cool night air of the garden to clear his mind. In a few minutes, he rushed back into the room, crying jubilantly, I have it! I have it! Indeed, he did have some plans in his hands. They were the plans showing the Great Seal as we know it today. Asked how he got the plans, Jefferson told a strange story. A man approached him wearing a black cloak that practically covered him, face and all, and he told him that he, the stranger, knew they were trying to devise a seal and that he had a design which was appropriate and meaningful. After the excitement died down, the three went into the garden to find the stranger, but he was gone. Thus, neither these founding fathers, nor anybody else, ever knew who really designed the great seal of the United States. Pat. Illuminati Project Memo 11, 7 stroke 29. J.M. The latest I've found on the Iron Pyramid is in a San Francisco underground paper. Planet, San Francisco, July 1969, Volume 1, Number 4, suggesting it as a symbol for Timothy Leary's political party when he was running for governor of California instead of just running. 
The emblem is a tentative design for the party's campaign button. One wag suggests that everyone cut out the circle from the back of a dollar bill and send the holy dollar to Governor Leary so he could wallpaper his office with them. Then paste the emblem on your front door to signify your membership in the party. Translations. The year of the beginning new secular order. Both translations are wrong, of course. Anuit coeptis means he blesses our beginning. And Novus Ordo Seclorum means a new order of the ages. Ah, well, scholarship was never the hippie's strong point. But Tim Leary, an Illuminatus, and pasting the eye on the door, I can't help but think of the Hebrews marking their doorways with the blood of a lamb so that the angel of death would pass by their houses. Pat. Illuminati Project Memo 12. Eight stroke three. J.M. I've finally found the basic book on the Illuminati. Proofs of a Conspiracy by John Robison. Christian Book Club of America, Hawthorne, California, 1961. Originally published in 1801. Robison was an English mason who discovered through personal experience that the French Masonic lodges such as the Grand Orient, were Illuminati fronts and were the main instigators of the French Revolution. His whole book is very explicit about how Weishaupt worked. Every infiltrated Masonic group would have several levels, like an ordinary Masonic lodge, but as candidates advance through the various degrees, they would be told more about the real purposes of the movement. Those at the bottom simply thought they were Masons. In the middle levels, they knew they were engaged in a great project to change the world. But the exact nature of the change was explained to them according to what the leaders thought they were prepared to know. Only those at the top knew the secret, which, according to Robeson, is this. The Illuminati aims to overthrow all government and religion setting up an anarcho-communist free-love world. And because the end justifies the means, a principle Weishaupt acquired from his Jesuit youth, they didn't care how many people they killed to accomplish that noble purpose. Robeson knows nothing of earlier Illuminati movements, but does say specifically that the Bavarian Illuminati was not destroyed by the government's crackdown in 1785, but was, in fact, still active, both in England and France, and possibly elsewhere, when he wrote in 1801. On page 116, Robeson lists their existing lodges as follows. Germany, 84 lodges. England, 8 lodges. Scotland, two. Warsaw, two. Switzerland, many. Rome, Naples, Ancona, Florence, France, Holland, Dresden, four. United States of America, several. Robeson's conclusion, page 269, is worth quoting. Nothing is as dangerous as a mystic association. The object remaining a secret in the hands of the managers, the rest simply put a ring in their own noses by which they may be led about at pleasure. And still panting after the secret, they are the more pleased, the less they see. Pat. At the bottom of the page was a note in pencil, scrawled with a decisive masculine hand. It said, In the beginning was the word... And it was written by a baboon. Illuminati Project, Memo 13, 8 stroke 5. J.M. The survival of the Bavarian Illuminati throughout the 19th century and into the 20th is the subject of World Revolution by Nesta Webster, Constable of Company, London, 1921. 
Mrs. Webster follows Robeson fairly closely on the early days of the movement up to the French Revolution, but then veers off and says that the Illuminati never intended to create their utopian anarcho-communist society. That was just another of their masks. Their real purpose was dictatorship over the world. And so they soon formed a secret alliance with the Prussian government. All subsequent socialist, anarchist and communist movements are mere decoys, she argues, behind which the German general staff and the Illuminati are plotting to overthrow other governments so Germany can conquer them. She wrote right after England fought Germany in the First World War. I see no way of reconciling this with the Bircher's thesis that the Illuminati has become a front for the Rhodes Scholars to take over the world for English domination. Obviously, as Robeson states, the Illuminati say different things to different people to get them into the conspiracy. As for the links with modern communism, here are some passages from her pages 234 to 45. But now that the first Internationale was dead, it became necessary for the secret societies to reorganise. And it is at this crisis that we find that formidable sect springing to life again, the original Illuminati of Weishaupt. What we do know definitely is that the society was refounded in Dresden in 1880 that it was consciously modelled on its 18th century predecessor is clear from the fact that its chief, one Leopold Engel, was the author of a lengthy panegyric on Weishaupt and his order, entitled Geschichte des Illuminaten Ordens, published in 1906. In London, a lodge called by the same name carried on the right of Memphis, founded, it is said, by Cagliostro on Egyptian models, and initiated adepts into illuminized Freemasonry. Was it a mere coincidence that in July 1889 an International Socialist Congress decided that May the 1st, which was the day on which Weishaupt founded the Illuminati, should be chosen for an annual international labour demonstration? Illuminati Project Memo 14 8 stroke 6 JM And here's still another version of the origin of the Illuminati from the Kabbalist Eliphas Levi The History of Magic by Eliphas Levi Borden Publishing Company Los Angeles 1963 page 65 he says there were two Zoroasters, a true one who taught white right-hand magic and a false one who taught black left-hand magic, he goes on. To the false Zoroaster must be referred the cultus of material fire and that impious doctrine of divine dualism which produced at a later period the monstrous gnosis of manes the false principles of spurious masonry. The Zoroaster in question was the father of that materialised magic which led to the massacre of the Magi, and brought their true doctrine at first into proscription and then oblivion. Inspired by the spirit of truth, the church was forced to condemn, under the names of magic, Manichaeanism, Illuminism and Masonry, all that was in kinship, remote or approximate, with the primitive profanation of the mysteries. One signal example is the history of the Knights Templar, which has been misunderstood to this day. Levi does not elucidate that last sentence. It is interesting, however, that Nestor Webster, see Memo 13, also traced the Illuminati to the Knights Templar whereas Daral and most other sources track them eastward to the Hashishim. Is all this making me paranoid? I'm beginning to get the impression that the evidence has not only been hidden in obscure books, but also made confusing and contradictory to discourage the researcher. Pat. Scrawled on the bottom of this memo was a series of jottings in the same masculine hand. Malik's sole guest, 
that had jotted the baboon reference on Memo 12. The jotting said, Check on order of de mole. Templar were kicked out of the church, Barney said, for trying to combine Christian and Muslim ideas. Last year, my brother, the Jesuit, gave a lecture on how modern ideas are just old heresies from the Middle Ages warmed over. I had to go for politeness's sake. I remember something else he said about the Templars. They were engaged in what he called unnatural sex acts. In other words, they were faggots. You get the impression that all these groups related to the Illuminati are all male? Maybe the big secret they're hiding so fanatically is that they're all some vast worldwide homosexual plot. I've heard showbiz people complain about what they call the Homin Turn, a homo organization that tries to keep all the best jobs for other fruits. How does that sound? Sounds plausible, so said ironically. But it also sounds plausible to say the Illuminati is a Jewish conspiracy, a Catholic conspiracy, a Masonic conspiracy, a communist conspiracy, a banker's conspiracy, and I suppose we'll eventually find evidence to suggest it's an interplanetary scheme masterminded from Mars or Venus. Don't you see, Barney? Whatever they're really up to, they keep creating masks so all sorts of scapegoat groups will get the blame for being the real Illuminati. He shook his head dizzy. They're smart enough to know they can't operate indefinitely without a few people eventually realizing something's there. So they've taken that into account and arranged for an inquisitive outsider to get all sorts of wrong ideas about who they are. They're dogs, Muldoon said. Intelligent talking dogs from the Dog Star Sirius. They came here and ate Malik. Just like they ate that guy in Kansas City, except that time they didn't get to finish the job. He turned back and read from Memo 8. With his throat torn, as if by the talons of some enormous beast. No animal was reported missing from any of the local zoos. He grinned. Lord God, I'm almost ready to believe it. Miskatonic University in Arkham, Massachusetts is not a well-known campus by any means. And the few scholarly visitors who come there are an odd lot, drawn usually by the strange collection of occult books given to the Miskatonic Library by the late Dr. Henry Armitage. Miss Doris Horace, the librarian, had never seen quite such a strange visitor, though, as this professor, J.D. Mallison, who claimed to come from Dayton, Ohio, but spoke with an unmistakable New York accent. Considering his furtiveness, she found it no surprise that he spent the whole day, June the 26th, 1969, poring over the rare copy of Dr. John Dee's translation of the Necronomicon of Abdul al Hatzred. That was the book most of the queer ones went for. That or the Book of Sacred Magic of Abra Melin the Mage. Doris didn't like the Necronomicon, although she considered herself an emancipated and free-thinking young woman. There was something sinister, or to be downright honest about it, perverted about that book, and not in a nice, exciting way, but in a sick and frightening way. All those strange illustrations, always with five-sided borders, just like the Pentagon in Washington, but with these people inside doing all these freaky sex acts with these other creatures who weren't people at all. It was, frankly, Doris's opinion that old Abdul al Hatsred had been smoking some pretty bad grass when he dreamed up those things. Or maybe it was something stronger than grass, she remembered one sentence from the text. Only those who have eaten a certain alkaloid herb whose name it were wise not to disclose to the unilluminated, may in the fleshy see a shoggoth. I wonder what a shoggoth is, Doris thought idly, 
probably one of those disgusting creatures that the people in the illustrations are doing those horny things with. Look. She was glad when J.D. Mallison finally left and she could return the Necronomicon to its position on the closed shelves. She remembered the brief biography of crazy old Abdul al read that Dr. Armitage had written and also given to the library. Spent seven years in the desert and claimed to have visited Irem, the city forbidden in the Koran, which al read asserted was of pre-human origin. Silly. Who was around to build cities before there were people? Those shoggoths? An indifferent Muslim, he worshipped beings whom he called yog Sothoth and Cthulhu. And that insidious line, According to contemporary historians, al Hatswed's death was both tragic and bizarre, since it was asserted that he was eaten alive by an invisible monster in the middle of the marketplace. Dr. Armitage had been such a nice old man, Doris remembered, even if his talk about cabalistic numbers and Masonic symbols was a little peculiar at times. Why would he collect such icky books by creepy people? He asked, Do you have to fly back to New York today? Can you possibly stay over a night? I got something I'd like you to see. It's time we started reaching people in your generation and really showing you instead of just telling you. Are you game? And Joe Malik, ex Trotskyist, ex engineering student, ex liberal, ex Catholic, heard himself saying, Yes. And heard a louder voice, unspeaking, uttering a more profound. Yes. Deep inside himself, he was game. For astrology, for I Ching, for LSD, for demons, for whatever Simon had to offer as an alternative to the world of sane and rational men who were sanely and rationally plotting their course toward what could only be the annihilation of the planet. We shall not be moved. God is dead, the priest chanted. God is dead, the congregation repeated in chorus. God is dead. We are all absolutely free, the priest intoned more rhythmically. God is dead, the congregation picked up the almost hypnotic beat. 
We are all absolutely free. Joe shifted nervously in his chair. The blasphemy was exhilarating, but also strangely disturbing. He wondered how much fear of hell still lingered in the back corridors of his skull, left over from his Catholic boyhood. They were in an elegant apartment high above Lakeshore Drive. We always meet here, Simon had explained, because of the acrostic significance of the street name. And the sounds of the automobile traffic far below mingled strangely with the preparations for what Joe already guessed was a black mass. Do what thou wilt shall be the whole of the law, the priest chanted. Do what thou wilt shall be the whole of the law, Joe repeated with the rest of the congregation. The priest, who was the only one who had not removed his clothes before the beginning of the ceremony, was a slightly red-faced middle-aged man in a Roman collar, and part of Joe's discomfort derived from the fact that he looked so much like every Catholic priest he had known in his childhood. It had not helped matters that he had given his name when Simon introduced Joe to him as Padre Pederastia, which he pronounced with a very campy inflection, looking flirtatiously directly in Joe's eyes. The congregation divided, in Joe's mind, into two easily distinguishable groups. Poor full-time hippies from the old town area and rich part-time hippies from Lakeshore Drive itself, and no doubt also from the local advertising agencies on Michigan Avenue. There were only eleven of them, however, including Joe, and Padre Pederastia made twelve. Where was the traditional thirteenth? Prepare the pentad, Padre Pederastia commanded. Simon and a rather good-looking young female both quite unselfconscious in their nakedness, arose and left the group, walking toward the door which Joe had assumed led to the bedroom area. They stopped to take some chalk from a table on which hashish and sandalwood incense were burning in a goat's head taper, then squatted to draw a large pentagon on the blood-red rug. A triangle was then added to each side of the pentagon, forming a star, the special kind of star, Joe knew, which was known as pentagram, symbol of werewolves and also of demons. He found himself remembering the corny old poem from the Lon Chaney Jr. movies, but it suddenly didn't sound like kitsch anymore. Even a man who is pure of heart and says his prayers by night can turn to a wolf when the wolf bane blooms and the autumn moon is bright. I owe, the priest chanted raptly. I owe, the chorus came. I owe, e owe, evo e, the chant rose weirdly. I owe, e owe. Every the rhythmic reply came in cadence. Joe felt a strange, ashy, acrid taste gathering in his mouth, and a coldness creeping into his toes and fingers. The air, too, seemed suddenly greasy and unpleasantly, mucidly moist. I O E O Evo A He. The priest screamed in fear or in ecstasy. I O E O Evo A E. Joe heard himself joining the others. Was it imagination, or were all their voices subtly changing in a bestial and pongoid fashion? All son of va oresagi, the priest said more softly. All son of Vaoresisaji, they chorused. It is accomplished, the priest said. We may pass the guardian. The congregation arose and moved toward the door. Each person, Joe noticed, was careful to step into the pentagram and pause there a moment, gathering strength before actually approaching the door. When it was his turn, he discovered why. 
The carving on the door, which had seemed merely obscene and ghoulish from across the room, was more disturbing when you were closer to it. It was not easy to convince yourself that those eyes were just a trick of Tromp de Loy. The mind insisted on feeling that they very definitely looked at you, and not affectionately as you passed. This thing was the guardian, which had to be pacified before they could enter the next room. Joe's fingers and toes were definitely freezing, and Otto's suggestion didn't seem a very plausible explanation. He seriously wondered about the possibility of frostbite, but then he stepped into the pentagram and the cold suddenly decreased. The eyes of the Guardian were less menacing, and a feeling of renewed energy flowed through his body, such as he had experienced in a sensitivity training session after he had been cajoled by the leader into unleashing a great deal of pent-up anxiety and rage by kicking, screaming, weeping and cursing. He passed the Guardian easily and entered the room where the real action would occur. It was as if he had left the 20th century. The furnishings and the very architecture were Hebraic, Arabic and medieval European, all mixed together in a most disorienting way and entirely unrelieved by any trace of the modern or functional. A black draped altar stood in the centre, and upon it lay the thirteenth member of the coven. She was a woman with red hair and green eyes, the traits which Satan supposedly relished most in mortal females. There had been a time, Joe remembered, when any woman having those features was automatically suspected of witchcraft. She was, of course, naked, and her body would be the medium through which this strange sacrament would be attempted. What am I doing here? Joe thought frantically. Why don't I leave these lunatics and get back to the world I know? The world where all the horrors are, after all, merely human. But he knew the answer. Notes found by a TWA stewardess in a seat vacated by a Mr. John Mason after a Madison, Wisconsin to Mexico City flight, June the 29th, 1969. We only robbed from the banks what the banks robbed from the people. Dillinger, Crown Point Jail, 1934, could have come from any anarchist text. Lucifer, bringer of light. Weishaupt's illumination and Voltaire's enlightenment, from the Latin lux, meaning light. Christianity, all in threes, trinity, etc. Buddhism in fours. Illuminism in fives. A progression. Hopi teaching. All men have four souls now, but in future we'll have five souls. Find an anthropologist for more data on this. Who decided the Pentagon building should have that particular shape? Kick out the jams. Cross-check. Yok so taught in Pnactotic manuscripts could be Yog Sothoth. Must get Simon to explain the yellow sign and the Aklo chants. Might need protection. C says the H neophobe type outnumbers us 1,000 to 1. If so, all this is hopeless. What gets me is how much has been out in the open for so long. Not just in Lovecraft, Joyce, Melville, etc., or in the Bugs Bunny cartoons, but in scholarly works that pretend to explain. Anybody who wants to go to the trouble can find out, for instance, that the secret of the Eleusinian mysteries was the words whispered to the novice after he got the magic mushroom, Osiris is a black god. Five words, of course. But no historian, archaeologist, anthropologist, folklorist, etc. has understood. 
or those who did understand didn't care to admit it. Can I trust C? For that matter, can I trust Simon? This matter of Tlarlock should convince me one way or the other. When Joe Malik got off the plane at Los Angeles International Airport, Simon was waiting for him. We'll talk in your car, Joe said briefly. The car being Simon's was naturally a psychedelic Volkswagen. Well? He asked as they drove out of the airport onto Central Avenue. It all checks out, Joe said with an odd calm. It did rain blue cats when they dug up Tlaloc. Mexico City had unusual and unseasonable rains ever since. The missing tooth was on the right, and the corpse at the Biograph Theater had a missing tooth on the left. And all the rest of it, the law of fives and all. I'm sold. I no longer claim membership in the Liberal Intellectual Guild. You behold in me a horrible example of creeping mysticism. Ready to try acid? Yes, Joe said. I'm ready to try acid. I only regret that I have but one mind to lose for my Shiva Dashana. Right on. First, though, you'll meet him. I'll drive right to his bungalow. It's not far from here. Simon began humming as he drove. Joe recognized the tune as the fugs. Ramesses, too, is dead, my love. They drove for a while in silence, and Joe finally asked, How old is our little group exactly? Since 1888, Simon said. That's when Rhodes horned in and they kicked out the jams. Like I told you in Chicago after the Sabbath. And Karl Marx, a schmuck, a dupe, a nebiche from the word go. Simon made an abrupt turn. Here we are at his house. The greatest headache they had since Harry Houdini knocked out their spiritualist fronts. He grinned. How do you think you'll feel talking to a dead man? Weird, Joe said. But I felt weird for the last week and a half. Simon parked the car and held the door open. Just think, he said. Hoover's sitting there every day with the desk mask on his desk and half suspecting deep down in his bones how we suck at him. They crossed the yard of the small modest bungalow. What a front, huh? Simon chuckled. He knocked. A little old man. He was five foot seven exactly, Joe remembered from the FBI files. Opened the door. Here's our new recruit, Simon said simply. Come in, John Dillinger said. And tell me how an asshole egghead like you can help us beat the shit out of those motherfucking Illuminati cocksuckers. the jams in Michigan City Prison. Dillinger, much relaxed and less arrogant, was saying as he, Simon and Joe, sat in his living room, drinking black Russians. And Hoover knew from the beginning, Joe asked. Of course. I wanted the bastard to know. Him and every other high-ranking Mason and Rosicrucian and Illuminati frontman in the country. The old man laughed harshly. 
except for his unmistakable eyes, which still held the strange blend of irony and intensity that Joe had noted in the 1930s photos. He was indistinguishable from any other elderly fellow who had come to California to enjoy his last years in the sun. First bank job I pulled off in Daleville, Indiana. I used the line that I always repeated, lie down on the floor and keep calm. Hoover couldn't miss it. That's been the motto of the jams ever since Diogenes the Cynic. He knew no ordinary bank robber would be quoting an obscure Greek philosopher. The reason I repeated it on every heist was just to rub it in and let him know I was taunting him. But going back to Michigan City Prison... Joe prompted, sipping his drink. Pierpoint was the one who initiated me. He'd been with the jams for years by then. I was just a kid, you know, in my early twenties... And I had only pulled one job, a real botch. I couldn't understand why I got such a stiff sentence. After the D.A. promised me clemency if I'd pled guilty, and I was kind of bitter. But old Harry Pierpoint saw my potential. Really does go back to Babylon. Joe prompted. I'm not much of an intellectual. Didn't you reply? Action is my arena. Let Simon tell you that part. Simon was eager to leap into the breach. The basic book to confirm our tradition, he said, is the Seven Tablets of Creation, which is dated at about 2500 B.C., the time of Sargon. It describes how Tiamat and Aspu, the first gods, were coexisting in Mumu, the primordial chaos. Von Junst, in his Onuksprelichen Kulten, tells how the justified ancients of Mumu originated, just about the time the Seven Tablets were inscribed. You see, under Sargon... The chief deity was Marduk. I mean, that was what the high priest gave out to the public. In private, of course, they worshipped Loxotot, who became the Yog sothoth of the Necronomicon. But maybe I'm going too fast. Getting back to the official religion of Marduk, it was based on usury. The priests monopolized the medium of exchange and were able to extract interest for lending it. They also monopolized the land and extracted tribute for renting it. It was the beginning of what we laughingly call civilization, which has always rested on rent and interest. The old Babylonian con. The official story was that Mamu was dead, killed in the war between the gods. When the first anarchist group arose, they called themselves Justified Ancients of Mamu, like Lao Tse and the Taoists in China. They wanted to get rid of usury and monopoly and all the other pig shit of civilization and go back to a natural way of life. So, Grok, they took the supposedly dead god Mamu and claimed he was still alive and was actually stronger than all the other gods. They had a good argument. Look around, they say. What do you see most of? Chaos, right? Therefore, the god of chaos is the strongest god and is still alive. Of course, we got our ass whipped good. We were just no match for the Illuminati in those days. Didn't have a clue about how they performed their miracles, for instance. So we got our asses whipped again in Greece when the jams got started again as part of the cynic movement. By the time the whole thing was happening again in Rome, usury and monopoly and the whole bag of tricks... The truce took place. The justified ancients became part of the Illuminati, a special group still keeping our own name but taking orders from the five. We thought we'd humanize them, like the anarchists who stayed in SDS after last year. And so it went until 1888, when Cecil Rhodes started the Circle of Initiates and the big schism occurred. Every meeting would have a faction of Rhodes boys carrying signs that said, Kick out the jams. It was the parting of the ways. They just didn't trust us, or maybe they were afraid of being humanized. But we had learned a lot by our long participation in the Illuminati conspiracy, and now we know how to fight them with their own weapons. Fuck their weapons. Dillinger interrupted. I like to fight them with my weapons. You're behind the big unsolved bank robberies of the last few years. Sure, just in the planning, though, I'm too old to vault over Teller's cages and carry on like I did back in the 30s. John is also fighting on another front. Simon interjected. Dillinger laughed. Yeah, he said. 
I'm the president of Laughing Buddha Jesus Phallus, Inc. You've seen him. If it's not an LBJP, it's not an LP. Laughing Buddha Jesus Phallus? Joe exclaimed. My God, you put out the best rock in the country, the only rock a man my age can listen to without wincing. Thanks, Dillinger said modestly. Actually, the Illuminati own the companies that put out most of the rock. We started Laughing Buddha Jesus Phallus to counterattack. We were ignoring that front until they got the MC5 to cut a disc called Kick Out the Jams, just to taunt us with old, bitter memories. So we came back with our own releases, and the next thing I know... I was making bales of money from it. We've also fed information through third parties to Christian Crusade in Tulsa, Oklahoma, so they could expose some of what the Illuminati are doing in the rock field. You've seen the Christian Crusade publications, Rhythm, Riots, and Revolution, and Communism, Hypnotism, and the Beatles, and so forth? Yeah, Jai said absently. I thought it was not literature. It's so hard, he added, to grasp the whole picture. You'll get used to it, Simon smiled. It just takes a while to sink in. Give him a hint, John, Simon suggested with an anticipatory grin. Tell him how you got out of Crown Point Jail. I've read two versions of that, Joe said. Most of the sources claim you carved a fake gun out of balsa wood and dyed it black with your shoe polish. Tolensburg says that you made that story up and leaked it out to protect the man who really managed the break for you. A federal judge that you bribed to smuggle in a real gun. Which was it? Neither, Dylan just said. Crown Point was known as the escape-proof jail before I crashed out of it, and believe me, it deserved the name. You want to know how I did it? I walked through walls. The picture I get is not a grand puppet master moving everybody on invisible strings but some sort of million-armed octopus. A millipus, let's call it. Constantly reaching out tentacles and often drawing back nothing but a bloody stump, crying, foiled again. But the millipus is very busy and quite resourceful. If it controlled the planet, it could choose either operating in the open or retaining secrecy. But since it doesn't have that omnipotence yet, it must choose to be as anonymous as possible. Therefore, many of its tentacles will be probing around in the areas of publication and communications. It wants to know when somebody is investigating it or getting ready to publicize an investigation he's already completed. Finding such a person, it then has two choices. Kill him or neutralize him. Killing may be resorted to in certain emergencies, but will be avoided when possible. You never know when a person of that sort has stashed extra copies of his documents in various unexpected places to be released in the event of his death. Neutralization is best, almost always. Saul paused to relight his pipe. And Muldoon thought... The most unrealistic aspect of Doyle's stories is Watson's admiration at these moments. I'm just irritated because he makes me feel like a chump for not seeing it myself. Go ahead, he said gruffly, saving his own deductions until Saul was finished. The best form of neutralization is recruitment, of course. But any crude and hurried effort at recruitment is known as taking your pants down in the espionage business because it makes you more vulnerable. The safest approach is gradual recruitment, disguised as something else. The best disguise, of course, is the pretense of helping the subject in his investigation. This also opens the second and preferable option, which is leading him on a wild goose chase, sending him looking for Illuminati and organizations which they have never really infiltrated. Feeding him balderdash like that stuff about the Illuminati coming from the planet Vulcan or being descended from Eve and the Serpent. Best of all, though, is telling him the purpose of the conspiracy is something other than it actually is. Especially if the story you sell him is in keeping with his own ideals, since this can then shade over into recruitment. Now, the sources this Pat unearthed mostly seem to come to one of two conclusions. The Illuminati doesn't exist anymore. Or, the Illuminati is virtually identical with Russian communism. 
The first I reject, because Malik and Pat have both disappeared, and two buildings, one here in New York and one way down in Mad Dog, have been bombed in a series palpably linked with an investigation of the Illuminati. You've already accepted that, but the next step is just as obvious. If the Illuminati tries to distort whatever publicity cannot be avoided, then we should look at the idea that the Illuminati is communist oriented as skeptically as we look at the idea that they don't even exist. So, let's look at the opposite hypothesis. Could the Illuminati be a far-right or fascist group? Well, if Malik's information was in any way accurate, they seem to have some kind of special headquarters or central office in Mad Dog, and that's Ku Klux and God's Lightning territory. Also, whatever their history before Adam Weiss helped, they seem to have gone through some reformation and revitalization under his leadership. He was a German and an ex-Catholic, just like Hitler. Considering the proclivities of the German character, Weishaupt could likely be an anti-Semite. Take up the many doctrine links between Illuminism and Freemasonry, and the known anti-Catholicism of the Masonic movement. Add in the fact that ex-Catholics are frequently bitter against the Church, and both Weishaupt and Hitler were ex-Catholics, and we get a hypothetical anti-Jewish, anti-Catholic, semi-mystical doctrine that we sell equally well in Germany and in parts of America. Finally. While some left extremists might want to kill the Kennedys and Reverend King, all three were more likely targets for right wingers, and the Kennedys would be especially abhorrent to anti-Catholic rightists. A last point, so said. Consider the left wing orientation of confrontation. The editor Malik would probably not give much credence to most of the sources quoted in the memos, since the majority are from rightist publications, and most of them allege that the Illuminati is a leftist plot. His most probable reaction would be to dismiss this as another right-wing paranoia, unless he had other sources besides his own research department. Notice how cagey he is. He doesn't tell his associate editor Peter Jackson anything about the Illuminati itself, just that he wants a new investigation of the last decade's assassinations. The bottom memo is so old and yellow it suggests he got his first clue several years ago, but didn't act. Pat asks him why he's hiding all this from the reporter George Dorn. Finally, he disappears. He was getting information from some place else, and it revealed a plot he could believe in and finally fear. That would probably be a fascist plot, anti-Catholic, anti-Jewish, and anti-Negro. Muldoon grinned. For once, I don't have to play Watson. He thought. Brilliant, he said. You never cease to amaze me, Saul. Would you glance at this though and tell me how it fits in? He handed over a piece of paper. I found it in a book on Malik's bedside table. The paper was a brief scrawl in the same handwriting as the occasional jottings on the bottoms of Pat's memos. Prez Garfield killed by Charles Guito, a Roman Catholic. Prez McKinley, ditto by Leon Sholgosh, a Roman Catholic. Prez Theodore Roosevelt, attempted assassination by John Schrank, a Roman Catholic. Prez Franklin Roosevelt, attempted assassination by Giuseppe Zangara, a Roman Catholic. President Harry Truman, attempted assassination by Griselio Torresola and Oscar Colaccio, two Roman Catholics. Prez Woodrow Wilson, somewhat mysterious death while tended by a Roman Catholic nurse. Prez Warren Harding, another mysterious death. One rumour, it was suicide, also attended by a Catholic nurse. Prez John Kennedy, assassination inadequately explained. Head of CIA then was John McCone, a Roman Catholic, who helped write the inconclusive and contradictory Warren report. House of Representatives, March the 1st, 1964. Five congressmen wounded by Lebron Miranda Codero Rodriguez assassination squad, all Roman Catholics. When Saul looked up, Barney said pleasantly, I found it in a book, like I said. The book was Rome's Responsibility for the Assassination of Abraham Lincoln by General Thomas M. Harris. Harris points out that John Wilkes Booth, 
the Surratt family, and all the other conspirators were Catholics, and argues they are acting under orders from the Jesuits. Barney paused to enjoy Saul's expression and went on. It occurs to me that, using your principle that most of the memos are full of false leads, we might question the idea that the Illuminati uses the Masons as a front to gather recruits. They would probably need some similar organization, though. One that exists all over the world. Has mysterious rites and secrets, inner orders to which a select few are recruited, and a pyramidal authoritarian structure compelling everybody to take commands from above whether they understand them or not. One such organization is the Roman Catholic Church. Saul picked up his pipe from the floor. He didn't seem to remember having dropped it. My turn to say brilliant, he murmured finally. Are you going to stop going to Mass on Sunday? Do you really believe it? Muldoon laughed. After twenty years, he said, I finally did it. I got one jump ahead of you, Saul. You were standing face to face with the truth, eyeball to eyeball, nose to nose, mouth to mouth, but you were so close that your eyes crossed and you saw it backward. No, it's not the Catholic Church. You made a good guess in saying it was anti-Catholic as well as anti-Jewish and anti-Negro. But it's inside the Catholic Church and always has been. In fact, the Church's efforts to root it out have given Holy Mother Rome a very unfortunate reputation for paranoia and hysteria. Its agents make a special effort to enter the priesthood in order to obtain holy objects for use in their own bizarre rites. They also try to rise as high in the church as they can to destroy it from within. Many times they've recruited and corrupted whole parishes, whole orders of clergy, even whole provinces. They probably got the vice helped when he was still a Jesuit. They've infiltrated that order several times in history, and the Dominicans even more. If caught in criminal acts, they make sure that their cover Catholicism and not their true faith is publicized just like this list of assassins. Their god is called the Light Bearer, and that's probably where the word illumination comes from. And Malik asked about him a long time ago and was told by this W.H., quite correctly, that they still exist. I'm talking about the Satanists, of course. Then this person, this being, Joe protested, Really is supernatural. Supernatural schmoopernatural. Simon grimaced. You're still like the people in that mathematical parable about flatland. You can only think in categories of right and left, and I'm talking about up and down. So you say supernatural. There is no supernatural. There are just more dimensions than you're accustomed to, that's all. If you were living in Flatland and I stepped out of your plane into a plane at a different angle, it would look to you as if I'd vanished into thin air. Somebody looking down from our three-dimensional viewpoint would see me going off at a tangent from you and wonder why you were acting so distressed and surprised about it. But the flash of light, it's energy transformation. Simon explained patiently. Look. The reason you can only think three-dimensionally is because there are only three directions in cubicle space. That's why the Illuminati and some of the kids they've allowed to become partially Illuminized lately refer to ordinary science as square. The basic energy vector coordinates of universe are five-dimensional, of course, and can best be visualized in terms of the five sides of the Illuminati Pyramid of Egypt. Five sides? Joe objected. It only has four. You're ignoring the bottom. Oh, go on. Energy is always triangular, not cubical. Bucky Fuller has a line on this, by the way. He's the first one outside the Illuminati to discover it independently. The basic energy transformation we're concerned with is the one Fuller hadn't discovered yet. Although he said he's looking for it. The one that ties mind into the matter-energy continuum. The pyramid is the key. You take a man in the lotus position and draw lines from his pineal gland, the third eye, as the Buddhists call it, to his two knees, and from each knee to the other. And this is what you get. Simon sketched rapidly in his notepad and passed it over to Joe. When the pineal eye opens 
After fear is conquered, after your first bad trip, you can control the energy field entirely. Simon went on. An Irish illuminatus of the ninth century, Scotus Ergina, put it very simply, in five words, of course, when he said, Omnia quia sunt, lumina sunt. All things that are, are lights. Einstein also put it into five symbols when he wrote E equals MC squared. The actual transformation doesn't require atomic reactors and all that jazz once you learn how to control the mind vectors, but it always lets off one hell of a flash, as John can tell you. Damn near blinded me and knocked me on my ass that first time in the woods. Didn't you agree? But I was sure glad to know the trick. I was never afraid of being arrested after that, because I could always walk out of any jail they put me in. That's why the feds decided to kill me, you know. It was embarrassing to always find me wandering around loose again after a few days after they locked me up. You know, the background to the Biograph Theater scam. They killed three guys in Chicago without giving them a chance to surrender because they thought I was one of them. Well, those three were all wanted in New York for armed robbery, so nobody criticized the cops much for that caper. But then up in Lake Geneva, Wisconsin, they shot three very respectable businessmen, and one of them went and died. And Hoover's heroes caught all sorts of crap from the newspapers. So I knew where it was at. I could never again surrender and walk away a few days later. We had to produce a body for them. The old man looked suddenly sad. There was one possibility that we hated to think about. But luckily, it didn't come to that. The gimmick we finally worked out was perfect. And everything really follows the Fives Law? Joe asked. More than you can guess. Dillinger remarked blandly. Even when you're dealing with social fields, Simon added. We've run studies of cultures where the Illuminati were not in control and they still follow Weishaupt's five-stage pattern. Verwirrung, Zweitracht, Unordnung, Bientenherrschaft, and Grummet. That is, chaos, discord, confusion, bureaucracy, and aftermath. America right now is between the fourth and fifth stages, or you might say that the older generation is mostly in the Bientenherrschaft, and the younger generation is moving into Grummet rapidly. Joe took another stiff drink and shook his head. But why do they leave so much of it out in the open? I mean, not merely the really shocking things you told me about the Bugs Bunny cartoons, but putting the pyramid on the dollar bill where everybody sees it almost every day. Hell, Simon said, look what Beethoven did when Vice helped illuminated him, went right home and wrote the Fifth Symphony. You know how it begins. Ba da da boom. Morse code for five. The Roman numeral for five. Right out in the open, as you say. It amuses the devil out of them to confirm their low opinion of the rest of humanity by putting things up front like that and watching how almost everybody misses it. Of course, if somebody doesn't miss something, they recruit him right away. Look at Genesis. Looks fit. Right on the first page. They do it all the time. The Pentagon Building, 23 Skidoo, the lyrics of rock songs like Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds. How obvious can you get? Melville was one of the most outrageous of the bunch. The very first sentence of Moby Dick tells you he's a disciple of Hassan Hissaber, but you can't find a single Melville scholar who's followed up that lead in spite of Ahab being a truncated anagram of Saba. He even tells you again and again, directly and indirectly, that Moby Dick and Leviathan are the same creature, and that Moby Dick is often seen at the same time in two different parts of the world. But not one reader in a million grocks. What he's hinting at, there's a whole chapter on whiteness and why white is really more terrifying than black. All the critics miss the point. Osiris is a black God, Joe quoted. Right on, you're going to advance fast, Simon said enthusiastically. In fact, I think it's time for you to get off the verbal level and really confront your own Lucy in the sky with diamonds, your own Lady Isis. Yeah, didn't you say it? The Leaf Erickson is laying off sure near California right now. Hagbard's running some hashish to the students at Berkeley. 
He's got a new black chick in his crew who plays the Lucy role extremely well. We'll have him send her ashore for the right. And I suggest that you two drive up to the Norton Lodge in Frisco and I'll arrange for her to meet you there. I don't like dealing with Hagboy, Simon said. He's a right-wing nut and so is his whole gang. He's one of the best allies we have against the Illuminati, Dillinger just said. Besides, I want to exchange some hemp script for some of his flax script. Right now, the Mad Dog Bunch won't accept anything but flax script. They think Nixon is really going to knock the bottom out of the hemp market. And you know what they do with Federal Reserve notes. Every time they get one, they burn it. Instant demorage, they call it. Pure aisle, Simon pronounced. It'll take decades to undermine the Fed that way. Well, Duran just said, those are the kinds of people we have to deal with. The jams can't do it all alone, you know. Sure, Simon shrugged. But it bugs me. He stood up and put his drink on the table. Let's go, he said to Joe. You're going to be illuminized. Dillinger accompanied them to the door and leaned close to Joe and said, A word of advice about the right. Yes? Dillinger lowered his voice. Lie down on the floor and keep calm, he said. And his old impudent grin flashed wickedly. Welcome to the Playboy Club. The beautiful blonde said, I'm your bunny, virgin. Saul took his seat in the dark, wondering if he had heard correctly. Virgin was an odd name for a bunny. Perhaps she had actually said Virginia. Yes, Virginia, there is a Santa Claus. How do you wish your steak, sir? The bunny was asking. A steak through the heart for a vampire. Medium well, Saul said, wondering why his mind was wandering in such odd directions. Odd erections, somebody said in the nearby dark, or was it a distorted echo of his own voice? Medium well, the bunny repeated, seemingly speaking to the wall. A medium wall, Saul thought. Immediately the wall opened and Saul was looking into a combination kitchen and butcher shop. A steer was standing not five feet from him, but before he could recover from this shock, a male figure, stripped to the waist and wearing the hood of a medieval executioner, caught his attention. With one stroke of a huge hammer, this figure knocked the steer unconscious and it fell to the floor with a crash. Immediately, the executioner produced an axe and chopped its head off. Blood gushed in a crimson pool from its neck. The wall closed, and Saul had the terrifying feeling that the whole scene had been a hallucination. That... He was losing his mind. All our lunches are educational today, the bunny said in his ear. We believe every customer should understand fully what's on the end of his fork and how it got there before he takes a bite. Good God, Saul said, getting to his feet. This wasn't a playboy club. It was some den of lunatics and sadists. He stumbled toward the door. No way out, a man at another table said softly as he passed. Saul. Saul. The maitre d murmured politely. Why dost thou persecute me? Hab Rochmunas. It's a drug, Saul said thickly. You've given me a drug.
Who did you say was looting this temple? He asked Hagbard. The Illuminati. The real force behind all communist and fascist movements. Whether you're aware of it or not, they're also already in control of the United States government. I thought everybody in your crowd was a right winger. And I told you, spatial metaphors are inadequate in discussing politics today. Hagbard interrupted. Well, you sound like a gang of right wingers. Up until the last minute, all I've heard from you and your people was that the Illuminati were commies or were behind the commies. Now you say they're behind fascism and behind the current government in Washington too. Hagbard laughed. We came on like right wing paranoids at first to see how you'd react. It was a test, and. You passed. You didn't believe us. That was obvious. But you kept your ears and your eyes open, and were willing to listen. If you were a right winger, we would have done our pro-communist rap. The idea is to find out if a new man or woman will listen, really listen, or just shut their minds at the first really shocking idea. I'm listening, but not uncritically. For instance, if the Illuminati control America already. What's the purpose of the assassinations? Their grip on Washington is still pretty precarious. They've been able to socialize the economy, but if they showed their hand now and went totalitarian all the way, there would be a revolution. Middle readers would rise up with right wingers and left libertarians, and the Illuminati aren't powerful enough to withstand that kind of massive revolution. But they can rule by fraud. And by fraud, eventually acquire access to the tools they need to finish the job of killing off the Constitution. What sort of tools? More stringent security measures, universal electronic surveillance, no-knock laws, stop-and-frisk laws, government inspection of all first-class mail, automatic fingerprinting, photographing, blood tests, and your analysis of any person arrested before he's charged with a crime. A law making it unlawful to resist even unlawful arrest. Laws establishing detention camps for potential subversives. Gun control laws. Restrictions on travel. The assassinations you see establish the need for such laws in the public mind. Instead of realizing that there is a conspiracy conducted by a handful of men, the people reason or are manipulated into reasoning. That the entire populace must have its freedom restricted in order to protect the leaders. The people agree that they themselves can't be trusted. Targets for assassinations will be mavericks of left or right who are either not part of the Illuminati conspiracy or have been marked as unreliable. The Kennedy brothers and Martin Luther King, for example, were capable of mobilizing a somewhat libertarian left-right, black-white populist movement. But the assassinations that have occurred so far are nothing to what will take place. The next wave will be carried out by the mafia, who will be paid in Illuminati gold. Not Moscow gold," said George with a smile. "The puppets in the Kremlin have no idea that they and the puppets in the White House are working for the same people. The Illuminati control all sorts of organizations and national governments without any of them being aware that others are also controlled. Each group thinks it's competing with the others." While actually each is playing its part in the Illuminati plan, even the Marituri, the six-person affinity groups which splintered from the SDS Weathermen because the Weathermen seemed too cautious, are under the control of the Illuminati. They think they're working to bring down the government, but actually they are strengthening its hand. The Black Panthers are also infiltrated. Everything is infiltrated. At present rate, within the next few years, the Illuminati will have the American people under tighter surveillance than Hitler had the Germans. And the beauty of it is, the majority of the Americans will have been so frightened by Illuminati-backed terrorist incidents that they will beg to be controlled, as a masochist begs for the whip. George shrugged. Hagbard sounded like a typical paranoid, but there was this submarine and the strange events of the past few days. So the Illuminati are conspiring to tyrannize the world. Is that it? Do you trace them back to the First International? No. They're what happened when the Enlightenment of the 18th century collided with German mysticism. The correct name for the organization is Ancient Illuminated Seers of Bavaria. 
According to their own traditions, they were founded or revived in 1776 on May 1st by a man named Adam Weishaupt. Weishaupt was an unfrog Jesuit and a Mason. He taught that religious and national governments had to be overthrown and the world ruled by an elite of scientifically minded materialistic atheists to be held in trust for the masses of mankind who would eventually rule themselves when enlightenment became universal. But this was only Weishaupt's outer doctrine. There was also an inner doctrine, which was that power is an end in itself, and that Weishaupt and his closest followers would make use of the new knowledge being developed by scientists and engineers to seize control of the world. Back in 1776, things were run largely by the church and the feudal nobility, with the capitalists slowly getting a bigger and bigger piece of the pie. Weishaupt declared that these groups were obsolete and it was time for an elite with a monopoly on scientific and technological knowledge to seize power, instead of producing a democratic society as the outer doctrine promised. The ancient illuminated seers of Bavaria would saddle mankind with a dictatorship that would last forever. Well, it would be logical enough that someone around that time would think of that, said George. And who more likely than a Mason who was an unfrocked Jesuit? You recognize that what I tell you is relatively plausible, said Hagbard. That's a good sign. A sign that it's plausible? Laughed George. No. A sign that you're the kind of person I'm always looking for. Another thing this explains, George said, is why Orthodox Marxism-Leninism, in spite of all its ideals, always turned out to be not worth a shit why it's always betrayed the people wherever it established itself. And it explains why there's such an inevitable quality about America's drift toward totalitarianism. Right, said Hagbard. America is the target now. The world will then be much as Orwell predicted in 1984. They bumped him off after it was published, you know. The book hit a little too close to home. He was obviously onto them. The references to inner and outer parties with different teachings, O'Brien's speech about power being an end in itself. And they got him. Orwell, you see, ran across them in Spain, where they were functioning quite openly at one point during the Civil War. But artists also arrive at the truth through their imaginations, if they let themselves wander freely. They're more likely to arrive at the truth the more scientific-minded people. You've just tied 200 years of world history up in a theory that would make me feel I should have myself committed if I accepted it. St. George. But I'm drawn to it, I admit. Partly intuitively, I feel you're a person who's essentially sane, not paranoid. Partly because the orthodox version of history that I was taught in school never made sense to me. And I know how people can twist history to suit their beliefs, and therefore I assume that the history I've learned is twisted partly because of the very wildness of the idea. If I learn one thing in the last few years, it's that the crazier an idea is, the more likely it is to be true. I think that what you've been telling me is the truth, or a version of it. I don't know whether to trust you completely, but I've got my sign. If the Bavarian Illuminati don't exist, something does. So then, where do we go from here? Hagbard smiled. Spoken like a true homo neophilus, George. Welcome to the tribe. We want to recruit you because you're so gullible. That is, gullible in the right way. You're skeptical about conventional wisdom, but attracted to unorthodox ideas. An unfailing mark of a homo neophilus. The human race is not divided into the irrational and the rational, as some idealists think. All humans are irrational. But there are two different kinds of irrationality. Those who love old ideas and hate and fear new ones, and those who despise old ideas and joyfully embrace new ones. Homo neophobus and Homo neophilus. Neophobus is the original human stock, the stock that hardly changed at all for the first four million years of human history. Neophilus is the creative mutation that has been popping up at regular intervals during the past million years, giving the race little forward pushes, the kind you give a wheel to make it spin faster and faster. 
Neophilus makes a lot of mistakes, but he or she moves. They live life the way it should be lived. 99% mistakes and 1% viable mutations. Everyone in my organization is Neophilus, George. That's why we're so far ahead of the rest of the human race. Concentrated Neophilus influences without any neophobe dilution. We make a million mistakes, but we move so fast that none of them catch up with us. Before you get any deeper, George, I'd like you to become one of us. Which means what? Become a legionnaire in the Legion of Dynamic Discord. George laughed. Oh, that sounds like a gas. But it's hard to believe that an organization with an absurd name like that could build anything as serious as this submarine or work for such a serious end as foiling the ancient illuminated seers of Bavaria. Hagbard shook his head. What's serious about a yellow submarine? It's right out of a rock song. And everybody knows people who worry about the Bavarian Illuminati are crackpots. Will you join the Legion in whatever spirit you choose? Certainly, said George promptly. Hagbard clapped him on the back. Ah, you're our type, all right. Good. Back through the door you came then, turn right, and through the golden door. Is there someone lifting a lamp beside it? There are no honest men on this voyage. Get along with you now. Hagbar's full lips, curled in a leer. You're in for a treat. Behind the golden door stood the lovely black receptionist. She had changed into a short red leather skirt that left all of her long legs in view. Her hands rested lightly on her white plastic belt. Hi, Stella. Sir George. Is that your name? Is it really Stella Morris? Sure. No honest man on this voyage is right. Hagbard was talking to me telepathically. He told me your name. I told you my name when you boarded the sub. You must have forgotten. You've been through a lot. And sad to say, you'll be going through a lot more. I must ask you to remove your clothing. The history of the world is the history of the warfare between secret societies. Ishmael Reed, Mumbo Jumbo. It was the year when they finally immanentized the Eschaton. On April the 1st, the world's great powers came closer to nuclear war than ever before. All because of an obscure island named Fernando Poe. By the time international affairs returned to their normal Cold War level, some wits were calling it the most tasteless April Fool's joke in history. I happen to know all the details about what happened, but I have no idea how to recount them in a manner that will make sense to most readers. For instance, I'm not even sure who I am, and my embarrassment on that matter makes me wonder if you will believe anything I reveal. Worse yet, I am at the moment very conscious of a squirrel in Central Park, just off 68th Street in New York City that is leaping from one tree to another. And I think that happens on the night of April the 23rd, or is it the morning of April the 24th? But fitting the squirrel together with Fernando Poo is, for the present, beyond my powers. I beg your tolerance. There is nothing I can do to make things any easier for any of us. And you will have to accept being addressed by a disembodied voice just as I accept the compulsion to speak out, even though I am painfully aware that I am talking to an invisible, perhaps non-existent audience. Wise men have regarded the earth as a tragedy, a farce, even an illusionist trick. But all, if they are truly wise and not merely intellectual rapists, recognize that it is certainly some kind of stage in which we all play roles, most of us being very poorly coached and totally unrehearsed before the curtain rises. Is it too much if I ask tentatively that we agree to look upon it as a circus? A touring carnival wandering about the sun for a record season of four billion years and producing new monsters and...
The first reports of the annihilation camps were passed on to the OSS by a Swiss businessman, evaluated as being one of the most trustworthy informants on affairs in Nazi Europe. The State Department decided that the stories were not confirmed. That was early in 1943. By autumn of that year, more urgent reports from the same source, transmitted still through the OSS, forced a major policy conference. It was again decided that the reports were not true. As winter began, the English government asked for another conference to discuss similar reports from their own intelligence networks and from the government of Romania. The delegates met in Bermuda for a warm sunny weekend and decided that the reports were not true. They returned to their work refreshed and tanned. The death trains continued to roll. Early in 1944, Henry Morgenthau, Jr., Secretary of the Treasury, was reached by dissenters in the State Department, examined the evidence, and forced a meeting with President Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Shaken by the assertion in Morgenthau's document, Roosevelt pledged that he would act at once. He never did. It was said later that the State Department convinced him once again of their own analysis. The reports simply were not true. When Mr. Hitler said Vernichtung, he had not really meant Vermichtung. An author, Ben Hecht, then placed an ad in the New York Times, presenting the evidence to the public. A group of prominent rabbis attacked him for alarming Jews unnecessarily and undermining confidence in America's chief executive during wartime. Finally, late that year, American and Russian troops began liberating the camps, and General Eisenhower insisted that news photographers take detailed movies, which were released to the whole world. In the interval between the first suppressed report by the Swiss businessman and the liberation of the first camp, six million people had died. Now, said Hagvard, I'm going to show you something I promised when we first met. It has to do with the catastrophe I've been talking about. Look there. The submarine had risen high above the continent, and it was possible to see landscapes stretching for hundreds of miles. Looking in the direction in which Hagbard pointed, George saw a vast expanse of black, glazed plain. Out of its centre jutted something white and pointed, like a canine tooth. It is said of them that they even controlled the comets in their courses, said Hagbard. He pointed again. The submarine sailed closer to the jutting white object. It was a four-sided white pyramid. Don't say it, said Mavis, giving him a warning look, and George remembered the tattoo he had seen between her breasts. He looked down again. They were above the pyramid now, and George could see the side that had been hidden from him as they approached. He saw what he had half feared, half expected to see, a blood-red design in the shape of a baleful eye. The Pyramid of the Eye, Hagbard said. It stood in the center of the capital of High Atlantis. It was built in the last days of that civilization by the founders of the world's first religion. It doesn't look very big from up here, but it's five times the size of the Great Pyramid of Cheops, which was modeled after it. It's made of an imperishable ceramic substance which repels even ocean sediment, as if the builders knew that to last it would have to survive tens of thousands of years of ocean burial. And maybe, depending on who they were, they did know that. Or maybe they just built well in those days. Peas, as you saw, was a pretty durable city, and that was built after High Atlantis fell by the second civilization I spoke of. That second civilization reached a level somewhat more advanced than that of the Greeks and Romans, but it was nothing like its predecessor. And some malevolent force seemed bent on destroying it too, and it was destroyed about ten thousand years ago. Of that civilization, we have the evidence of ruins. But of High Atlantis, we have only records and legends dug up from later civilizations. And, of course, poetry from the Porpoise Corpus. 
This is the only artifact, this pyramid. But its existence and durability prove that as long ago as ten Egypts, a race of men existed whose technology was far advanced beyond what we know today. So advanced that it took 20,000 years for that civilization's successor culture to disappear completely. The men who destroyed High Atlantis did their best to make it disappear, but they couldn't quite manage it. The Pyramid of the Eye, for instance, is indestructible, though it's probable that they didn't want to destroy it. Mavis nodded somberly. That is their most sacred shrine. In other words, said George, you're telling me that the people who destroyed Atlantis still exist. Do they have the powers they had then? Substantially, yes, said Hagbard. Is this the Illuminati you told me about? Illuminati, or ancient illuminated seers of Bavaria, is one of the names they have used, yes. So they didn't start in 1776. They go a long way back before that, right? Right, said Mavis. Then why did you lie to me about their history? And why the hell haven't they taken over the world by now, if they're all that powerful? When our ancestors were savages, they could have dominated them completely. Hagbard replied, I lied to you, because the human mind can only accept a little of the truth at a time. Also, initiation into Discordianism has stages. The answer to the other question is complicated, but I'll try to give it to you simply. There are five reasons. First, there are organizations like the Discordians, which are almost as powerful, and which know almost as much as the Illuminati, and which are able to thwart them. Second, the Illuminati are too small a group to enjoy the creative cross-fertilization necessary to progress of any kind and they have been unable to advance much beyond the technological level they reached 30,000 years ago. Like Chinese mandarins. Third, the Illuminati are hamstrung in their actions by the superstitious beliefs that set them apart from other Atlanteans. As I told you, they're the world's first religion. Fourth, the Illuminati are too sophisticated, ruthless, and decadent to want to take over the world. It amuses them to play with the world. Fifth, the Illuminati do rule the world, and everything that happens, happens by their sufferance. Those reasons contradict each other, said George. That's the nature of logical thought. All propositions are true in some sense, false in some sense, and meaningless in some sense. Hagbard didn't smile. The submarine had described a great arc as they talked, and now the Pyramid of the Eye was far behind them. The eye itself, since it faced eastward, was no longer visible. Below, George could see the ruins of several small cities at the edge of tall cliffs that fell away into darker depths. Cliffs that, doubtless, had been the seacoast of Atlantis at one time. Hagbard said, I've got a job for you, George. You're going to like it, and you're going to want to do it but it's going to make you shit a brick. We'll talk about it when we get to Chesapeake Base. Now, though, let's go down into the hold and have a look at our acquisitions. He flicked a switch. Fuck up. Get your finger out of your ass and drive this thing for a while. I'll see the statues later, said Mavis. I've got other things to do just now. George followed Hagbard down carpeted staircases and halls panelled in glowing polished oak. At last they came to a large hall which was apparently paved with marble flagstones. A group of men and women wearing horizontally striped nautical shirts similar to Hagbard's were clustered around four tall statues in the centre of the room. When Hagbard entered the room they stopped talking and stepped away to give him a clear look at the sculptures. The floor was covered with puddles of water and the statues themselves were dripping. No wiping them dry, Hagbard said. Every molecule is precious, just as it is, and the less disturbed, the better. He stepped closer to the nearest one and looked at it for a long moment. What do you say about a thing like this? It's beyond exquisite. Can you imagine what their art was like before the disaster? And to think the unbroken circle destroyed every trace of it, except for that crude, stupid pyramid. 
which is the greatest piece of ceramic technology in the history of the human race, said one of the women. George looked around for Stella Maris, but she wasn't there. Where's Stella? he asked Hagbard. Upstairs, minding the store. She'll see them later. The sculptures were unlike the work of any culture George knew, which was to be expected after all. They were at once realistic, fanciful, and abstractly intellectual. They bore resemblance to Egyptian and Mayan, classical Greek, Chinese, and Gothic, combined with a surprisingly modern-looking note. There were some qualities in the statues that were totally unique. No qualities doubtless lost by the civilizations to which Atlantis was ancestral, but that might have been found in known world art had there been other civilizations to preserve and emphasize them. This, George realized, was the er art. And looking at the statues was like hearing a sentence in the first language spoken by men. An elderly sailor pointing at the statue farthest from where they were standing. Look at that. Beatific smile. A woman thought of that statue, I bet. That's every woman's dream, to be totally self-sufficient. Some of the time, Joshua, said the Oriental woman who hadn't spoken before. But not all of the time. Now what I prefer is that. She pointed to another statue. Hagbard laughed. <laughs> you think that's just nice, healthy origenitalism, Sushi. But the child in the woman's arms is the son without a father, the self-begotten, and the couple at the base represent the unbroken circle of Gruad. Usually it's a serpent with its tail in its mouth, but in some of the earlier representations, the couple in oral intercourse symbolizes sterile lust. The unloved mother has her foot on the man's head to indicate that she conquers lust. The whole sculpture is the product of the foulest cult to come out of Atlantis. They originated human sacrifice. First, they practiced castration, but then they escalated to killing men instead of just cutting off their balls. Later, when women were subjugated, the sacrifice became a virgin female, supposedly to give her to the unloved ones while she was still pure. That halo around the child's head looks like the peace symbol, said George. Peace symbol, my ass, said Agbard. That's the oldest symbol of evil there is. Of course, in the cult of the unbroken circle, it was a symbol of good, but that's the same difference. They can't have been so vicious if they produced that statue, said the Oriental woman stubbornly. Could you deduce... The Spanish Inquisition from the painting of the manger at Bethlehem, said Agbard. Don't be naive, Miss Mao. He turned to George. The value of any one of these statues is beyond calculation, but not many people know that. I'm sending you to one who does. Robert Putney Drake. One of the finest art connoisseurs in the world and the head of the American branch of the World Crime Syndicate. You're going to see him with a gift from me. These four statues. The Illuminati were planning to buy his support with gold from the Temple of Tethys. I'm going to get to him first. If they only needed four statues, why were they trying to raise the whole temple? George asked. I think they wanted to remove the temple to Agarty, their stronghold under the Himalayas for safekeeping. I haven't been any closer to the Temple of Tethys than we were today, but I suspect it's a treasure house of evidence of High Atlantis. As such, it would be something the Illuminati would want to remove. Until now, there was no reason to, because no one had access to the sea bottom other than the Illuminati. Now I can get around down here just as well, better in fact than they can, and pretty soon others will be following. Several nations and many groups of private persons are exploring the undersea world. It's time for the Illuminati to finish taking away whatever tells of High Atlantis. Will they destroy that city we saw? And what about the Pyramid of the Eye? Hagbard shook his head. They'd be willing to let later Atlantean ruins to be found. That wouldn't say anything about their existence. As for the Pyramid of the Eye, I suspect they have a real problem with that. 
They can't destroy it, and even if they could, they wouldn't want to. But it's a dead giveaway to the existence of a super civilization in the past. Well, Saint George, not at all wanting to meet the head of the American Crime Syndicate. What we ought to do is go back and raise the Temple of Tethys ourselves before the Illuminati grab it. Good. Grief," said Miss Mao. "This happens to be the most critical moment in the history of this civilization. We don't have time to fiddle fuck around with archaeology." "He's just a legionnaire," said Hagbard. "Though after this mission, he'll know the fairest and become a deacon. He'll understand more then." "George, I want you to act as a go-between for the Discordian movement and the Syndicate." You're going to bring these four statues to Robert Putney Drake and tell him there are more where they came from. Ask Drake to stop working for the Illuminati, to take the heat off our people wherever he's after them, and to drop the assassination project the Illuminati have been working on with him. And as an earnest of good faith, he's to snuff twenty-four Illuminati agents for us in the next twenty-four hours. Their names will be contained in a sealed envelope. Atlantis also bothered Joe. After he saw it the first time, Hagbard took him for a ride in the Leaf Erikson. It was all too pat, too plausible, too good to be true. Especially the ruins of cities like Paos, with their architecture that obviously combined Egyptian and Mayan elements. Science has been flying on instruments like a pilot in a fog ever since 1900. He said casually to Hagbard on the return trip to New York. This was in 72, according to his later recollections. Fall of 72, almost two years after the test of Alm in Chicago. You've been reading Bucky Fuller, was Hagbard's cool reply. Or was it Kozhipsky? Never mind who I'm reading, Joe said directly. The thought in my head is that I never saw Atlantis any more than I ever saw Marilyn Monroe. I saw moving pictures, which you told me were television reception of cameras outside your sub, and I saw moving pictures of what Hollywood assured me was a real woman, even though she looked more like a design by Petty or Vargas. In the Marilyn Monroe case, it's reasonable to believe what I'm told. I don't believe a robot that good has been built yet, but Atlantis. I know special effects men who could build a city like that on a tabletop and have dinosaurs walking through it, and your cameras trained on it. You suspect me of trickery? Hagbard asked, raising his eyebrows. Trickery is your metier, Joe said bluntly. You're the Beethoven, the Rockefeller, the Michelangelo of deception, the Shakespeare of the gypsy switch, the two-headed nickel, and the rabbit in the hat. What little liver pills are to Carter, lies are to you. You dwell in a world of trap doors, sliding panels, and Hindu rope tricks. Do I suspect you? Since I met you, I suspect everybody. Glad to hear it. Hagbard grinned. You're well on your way to paranoia. Take this card and keep it in your wallet. When you begin to understand it, you'll be ready for your next promotion. Just remember. It's not true unless it makes you laugh. That is the one and sole and infallible test of all ideas that will ever be presented to you. And he handed Joe a card saying, "There is no friend anywhere." You can call me Doc Iggy. My full name at present is Doctor Ignotum P. Ignotius. The P stands for per. If you're a Latinist, you'll realize that translates as the unknown explained by the still more unknown. I think it's a quite appropriate name for my function tonight, since Simon brought you here to be illuminized. My slave name, before I was turned on myself, is totally immaterial. As far as I'm concerned, your slave name is equally pointless, and I'll call you by the password of the Norton Cabal, which Simon used at the door. Until morning, when the drug starts wearing off, you are you, Waskell Wabbit. That's you, the initial, not Y O U, by the way. 
We accept Bugs Bunny as an exemplar of Mummo here, too. But otherwise we have little in common with the SSS. That's the Satanists, Surrealists, and Sadists, the crew who began your illuminization in Chicago. All we share with them, actually, is the use of the Tristero Anarchist Postal System to evade the government's postal inspectors and a financial agreement whereby we accept their DMM script, Divine Marquis Memorial script, and they accept our hem script and the flax script of the Legion of Dynamic Discord, anything to avoid Federal Reserve notes, you know. It'll be a while before the acid starts working, so I'll just chat like this about things that are more or less trivial, or quadrivial, or maybe pentivial, until I can see that you're ready for more serious matters. Simon's in the chapel with a woman named Stellar, who you'll really dig, getting things ready for the ceremony. You might wonder why we're called the Norton Cabal. The name was chosen by my predecessor, Maliclips the Younger, before he left us to join the more esoteric group known as ELF, the Arisian Liberation Front. They're the occidental branch of the Hung Mung Tong Kong, and all their efforts go into a long-range anti-Illuminati project known only as Operation Mindfuck. But that's another very complicated story. One of Maliclips's last writings before he went into silence was a short paragraph saying, Everybody understands Mickey Mouse. Few understand Herman Hesse. Hardly anyone understands Albert Einstein. And nobody understands Emperor Norton. I guess Maliclips was already into the mindfuck mystique when he wrote that. Who was the Emperor Norton? Joe asks, wondering if the drug is beginning to work already, or Dr. Ignatius just has a tendency to speak more slowly than most people. Joshua Norton, Emperor of the United States and Protector of Mexico. San Francisco is proud of him. He lived in the last century and got to be emperor by proclaiming himself as such. For some mysterious reason, the newspapers decided to humor him and printed his proclamations. When he started issuing his own money, the local banks went along with the joke and accepted it on par with U.S. currency. When the vigilantes got into a lynching mood one night and decided to go down to Chinatown and kill some Chinese, Emperor Norton stopped them just by standing in the street with his eyes closed, reciting the Lord's Prayer. Are you beginning to understand Emperor Norton a little, Mr. Wabbit? A little, Joe said. A little. Well, Chew on this for a while, friend. There were two very sane and rational anarchists who lived about the same time as Emperor Norton across the country in Massachusetts, William Green and Lysander Spooner. They also realized the value of having competing currencies instead of one uniform state currency, and they tried logical arguments empirical demonstrations and legal suits to get this idea accepted. They accomplished nothing. The government broke its own laws to find ways to suppress Green's Mutual Bank and Spooner's People's Bank. That's because they were obviously sane, and their currency did pose a real threat to the monopoly of the Illuminati. But Emperor Norton was so crazy that people humored him, and his currency was allowed to circulate. Think about it. 
you might begin to understand why Bugs Bunny is our symbol and why our currency has the ridiculous name Hemscript. Hagbar Chaline and his Discordians, even more absurdly, call their money Flax Script. That commemorates the Zen master who was asked, What is the Buddha? and replied, Five pounds of flax. Why are you staring like that? Am I changing colors or growing bigger or something? Good. The acid is starting to work. Now, we can really get to the nitty-gritty. First of all, most of what I've been telling you is bullshit. The Illuminati have no millennia-old history, neither do the Jams. They invented their great heritage and tradition, Jacques de Molay and Charlemagne and all of it, out of whole cloth in 1776, picking up all sorts of out-of-context history to make it seem plausible. We've done the same. You might wonder why we copy them and even deceive our own recruits about this. Well, part of illumination, and we've got to be illuminized ourselves to fight them, is in learning to doubt everything. That's why Hagbard has that painting in his stateroom saying, Think for yourself, schmuck, and why Hassan i Sabah said, Nothing is true. You've got to learn to doubt us, too, and everything we tell you. There are no honest men on this voyage. In fact, maybe this part is the only lie I've told you all evening, and the Illuminati history before 1776 really is true and not an invention. Or maybe we're just a front for the Illuminati to recruit you indirectly. Feeling paranoid? Good. Illumination is on the other side of absolute terror. And the only terror that is truly absolute is the horror of realizing that you can't believe anything you've ever been told. You have to realize fully that you are a stranger and afraid in a world you never made, like Hausman says. Twenty-two big rhinoceroses, twenty-three big rhinoceroses. The Illuminati basically was structure-free. Hence their hang-up on symbols of geometric law and architectural permanence, ELF, had no symbol, and when asked for one by new recruits, replied loftily that their symbol could not be pictured since it was a circle whose circumference was everywhere, and its center nowhere. They were the most far-out group of all, and only the most advanced Discordians could begin to understand their gibberish. This, he said dramatically, is the sacred cow. <laughs> That's a symbol of technocracy, Joe said, giggling. Well... Dr. Ignatius smiled. At least you're original. Nine out of ten new members mistake it for the Chinese yin-yang, or the astrological symbol of cancer. It's similar to both of them. Symbol of Mamu, god of chaos. On the right, O oh nobly born, you will see the image of your female and intuitive nature called yin by the Chinese. The yin contains an apple, which is the golden apple of Eris, the forbidden apple of Eve, and the apple which used to disappear from the stage of the Flatbush burlesque house in Brooklyn when Linda LaRue did the split on top of it at the climax of her striptease. It represents the erotic, libidinal, anarchistic and subjective values worshipped by Hagbar Chaline and our friends in the Legion of Dynamic Discord, 
Now, O oh nobly born, as you prepare for total awakening, turn your eyes to the left, yang side of the sacred cow. This is the image of your male, rationalistic ego. It contains the pentagon of the Illuminati, the Satanists, and the U.S. Army. It represents the anal, authoritarian, structural, law and order values which the Illuminati have imposed through their puppet governments on most of the peoples of the world. This is what you must understand, O oh newborn Buddha. Neither side is complete or true or real. Each is an abstraction a fallacy. Nature is a seamless web in which both sides are in perpetual war, which is another name for perpetual peace. The equation always balances. Increase one side, and the other side increases by itself. Every homosexual is a latent heterosexual. Every authoritarian cop is the shell over an anarchistic libido. There is no vernichtung, no final solution, no pot of gold at the end of the rainbow. And you are not Saul Goodman when you're lost out here. Listen. The chaos you experience under LSD is not an illusion. The orderly world you imagine you experience under the artificial and poisonous diet which the Illuminati have forced on all civilized nations is the real illusion. I'm not saying what you are hearing. The only good Fenord is a dead Fenord. Never whistle while you're pissing. An obscure but highly significant contribution to sociology and epistemology occurs in Malignowski's study, Retroactive Reality, printed in Vieczny Kwiat w Tazda, the journal of the Polish Orthopsychiatric Society, for autumn 1959. Oh, affirmations are true in some sense, false in some sense, meaningless in some sense. True and false in some sense, true and meaningless in some sense, false and meaningless in some sense, true and false and meaningless in some sense. Do you follow me? In some sense. Chad Matters. Only Marxists. Dr. Riggie concluded, opening the door to usher Joe into the chapel room. Still believe in an objective history. Marxists and a few disciples of Ayn Rand. Jung took the parchment from Drake and stared at it. It's not to be signed in blood. What the hell is this yin-yang symbol with the pentagon and the apple? You're a fucking fake. His lips curled tightly in against his teeth. What do you mean? Said George through a throat that was rapidly closing up. I mean, you're not from the goddamn Illuminati, said Jung. Who the hell are you? Didn't you know that before I came here? That I'm not from the Illuminati? Said George. I I'm not trying to fake anybody out. Honest, really. I thought you knew the people who sent me. I never said I was from the Illuminati. Maldonado nodded. A slight smile bringing his face to life. I know who he is. The people of the old Stregen. The Sybil of Sybils. All hail the Scordia kid, right? Hail Harris, said George with a slight feeling of relief. Drake uh, frowned. Well, we seem to be at cross purposes. We were contacted by mail then by telephone, then by messenger, by parties who made it quite clear that they knew all about our business with the Illuminati. Now, to the best of my knowledge, perhaps Don Frederico knows better, there is only one organization in the world that knows anything about the AISB. 
and that is the AISB itself. George Catelli was lying. Maldonado raised a warning hand. Wait, up, everybody, for the bathroom. Drake sighed. Oh, Don Frederico, you and your tired notions of security. If my house isn't safe, we're all dead men as of this moment. And if the AISB is as good as it's said to be, an old trick like running water will be no obstacle to them. Let's conduct this discussion like civilized men, for God's sake, and not huddled around my shower stall. There are times when dignity is suicide, said Maldonado. He shrugged. But I yield. I'll settle the question with you in hell if you're wrong. I'm still in the dark, said Richard Young. I don't know who this guy is or where he's from. Look, Chinaman, said Maldonado. You know who the ancient illuminated shears of Bavaria are, right? Well, every organization has opposition, right? So do the Illuminati. Opposition that's like them. Religious, magical, spooky stuff. Not simply interested in becoming rich, as is our gentlemanly aim in life. Playing supernatural games. Capiche? Jung looks skeptical. You could be describing the Communist Party, the CIA, or the Vatican. Superficial, said Maldonado scornfully. An upstart compared with the AISB, because the Bavarian Illuminati aren't Bavarians, you understand. There's just a recent name and manifestation for their order. Both the Illuminati and their opposition, which this guy represents, go back a long ways before Moscow, Washington, or Rome. A little imagination is called for to understand this, Chinaman. If the Illuminati are yang, George said helpfully, we're yin. The only solution is a yin revolution, Dig. I'm a graduate of Harvard Law School, said Jung loftily, and I do not dig it. What are you, a bunch of hippies? We never made a deal with your bunch before, said Maldonado. They never had enough to offer us. Robert Putney Drake said, Yes, but you'd like to, though, Don Frederico. Haven't you had a bellyful of the others? I know I have. I know where you're from now, George. And you people have been making giant strides in recent decades. I'm not surprised that you're able to tempt us. It's worth our lives, and we are supposedly the most secure men in the United States, to betray the Illuminati. But I understand you offer us statues from Atlantis. By now, they should be uncrated, and that there are more where these came from. Is that right, George? Hank Vard had said nothing about that. But George was too worried about his own survival to quibble. Yes, he said. There are more, Drake said. Whether we want to risk our lives by working with your people will depend on what we find when we examine the objet d'art you are offering. Don Frederico, being a highly qualified expert in antiquities, particularly in those antiquities which have been carefully kept outside the ken of conventional archaeological knowledge, will pronounce on the value of what you've brought. As a Sicilian, thoroughly versed in his heritage, Don Frederico is familiar with things Atlantean, the Sicilians are about the only extant people who do know about Atlantis. It is not generally realized that the Sicilians have the oldest continuous civilization on the face of the planet, with all due respects to the Chinese. Drake nodded formally to Jung. I consider myself an American, said Jung, though my family knows a thing or two about Tibet that might surprise you. I'm sure, said Drake. Well, you shall advise as you are able. But the Sicilian heritage goes back thousands of years before Rome, as does their knowledge of Atlantis. There were a few things washed up on the shores of North Africa, a few things found by divers. It was enough to establish a tradition. If there were a museum of Atlantean arts, Don Frederico is one of the few people in the world qualified to be a curator. 
In other words, said Maldonado with a ghastly smile, those statues better be authentic, kid, because I will know if they are not. They are, said George. I saw them picked up off the bottom of the ocean myself. That's impossible, said Young. Let's look, said Drake. He stood up and placed the palm of his hand flat against an oak panel, which immediately slid to one side, revealing a winding metal staircase. Drake, leading the way, the four of them descended what seemed to George five stories to a door with a combination lock. Drake opened the door and they passed through a series of other chambers, ending up in a large underground garage. The golden apple truck was there, and beside it the four statues, freed of their crates. There was no one in the room. Where did everybody go? said Jung. They're Sicilians, said Drake. They saw these and were afraid. They did the job of uncrating them and left. His face and Maldonado's wore a look of awe. Jung's craggy features bore an irritated, puzzled frown. I'm beginning to feel... That I've been left out of a lot, he said. Later, said Maldonado. He took a small jeweler's glass out of his pocket and approached the nearest statue. This is where they got the idea for the Greek god Pan, he said. Well, you can see the idea was more complicated 20,000 years ago than 2,000. Fixing the jeweler's glass in his eye, he began a careful inspection of a glittering hoof. At the end of an hour, Maldonado, with the help of a ladder, had gone over each of the four statues from bottom to top with fanatical care and had questioned George about the manner of their seizure, as well as what little he knew of their history. He put his jeweler's glass away, turned to Drake and nodded. You've got the four most valuable pieces of art in the world. Drake nodded. I surmised as much. Worth more than all the gold in all the Spanish treasure ships there ever were. If I had not been dosed with a hallucinogenic drug, said Richard Young, I gather you are all saying these statues come from Atlantis. I'll take your word for it that they're solid gold, and that means there's a lot of gold there. The value of the matter is not worth one ten thousandth the value of the form, said Drake. That I don't see, said Jung. What is the value of Atlantean art if no reputable authority anywhere in the world believes in Atlantis? Maldonado smiled. There are a few people in the world who know that Atlantis existed and who know there is such a thing as Atlantean art. And believe me, Richard, those few got enough money to make it worth anyone's while who has a piece from the bottom of the sea. Any one of these statues could buy a middle-sized country. Drake clapped his hands with an air of authority. I'm satisfied if Don Frederico is satisfied for these and for four more like them, or the equivalent if four such statues simply don't exist. My hand is joined with the hand of the Discordian movement. Let us go back upstairs and sign the papers, in pen and ink. And then, George... We would like you to be our guest at dinner. George didn't know he had the authority to price four more statues, and he was certain that total openness was the only safe approach with these men. As they were climbing the stairs, he said to Drake, who was above him, I wasn't authorised by the man who sent me to promise anything more, and I don't believe he has any more at the moment, unless he has a collection of his own, I know these four statues are the only ones he captured on this trip. Drake let out a small fart. An incredible thing, it seemed to George, for the leader of all organized crime in the United States to do. Excuse me, he said. The exertion of these stairs is too much for me. Would love to put in an elevator, but that wouldn't be as secure. One of these days my heart will give out going up and down those stairs. The fart? smelled moderately bad, and George was glad when he had climbed out of its neighbourhood. He was surprised that a man of Drake's importance would acknowledge that he farted. Perhaps that kind of straightforwardness was a factor in Drake's success. George doubted that Maldonado would admit to a fart. The Don was too devious. 
He was not your earthy sort of Latin. He was paper thin and paper pale, like a Tuscan aristocrat of attenuated bloodline. They re-entered Drake's office, and Drake and Maldonado each signed the parchment scroll. After the phrase, for valuable consideration received, Drake inserted the words, and considerations of equal value yet to come. He smiled at George. Since you can't guarantee the additional objects, I'll expect to hear from your boss within 24 hours after you leave here. This whole deal is contingent upon the additional payment from you. The dinner was steak Diane, and it was served to the four men at a long table in a dining room hung with large old paintings. They were waited on by a series of beautiful young women, and George wondered where the gang leaders kept their wives and mistresses. In some sort of perder, perhaps. There was something Arabic about this whole setup. During the main course, a blonde in a long white gown, which left one breast bare, played the harp in a corner of the room and sang. There was conversation with the coffee... Four young women sat down briefly with the men and regaled them with witticisms and funny stories. With the brandy came Tarantella Serpentine. She was an amazingly tall woman, at least six feet two, with long blonde hair that was piled high on her head and fell below her shoulders. She was wearing tinkling gold bracelets around her wrists and ankles, and there were diaphanous veils wrapped around her slender body and nothing else. George could see pink nipples and dark crotch hair. When she strode through the door, Banana Nose Maldonado wiped his mouth with his napkin and began applauding gleefully. Robert Putney Drake smiled proudly, and Richard Young swallowed hard. George just stared. The star of our little rural retreat, said Drake by way of introduction. May I present Miss... Taron Teller, Serpentine. Maldonado's applause continued, and George wondered if he should join in. Music, oriental, but with a touch of rock, flooded the room. The sound reproduction equipment was excellent, nigh perfect. Taron Teller, Serpentine began to dance. It was a strange, hybrid sort of dance, a synthesis of belly dancing, go-go, and modern ballet. George licked his lips and he felt his face get warm, and his penis begin to throb and swell as he watched. Tarantella Serpentine's dance was even more sensuous than the dance Stella Maris had done when he was being initiated into the Discordian movement. After she had done three dances, Tarantella bowed and left. You must be tired, George, said Drake, resting his hand on George's shoulder. Suddenly, George realised he had been going on almost no sleep, except for the times he dozed off in the car on the way from Mad Dog to the Gulf. He had been under incredible physical, and even more important, emotional pressure. He agreed that he was tired, and praying that he would not be murdered in his sleep, he let Drake lead him to a bedroom. The bed was an enormous four-poster with a cloth of gold canopy. Naked? George slid between cool, crisp sheets, and clutching the top sheet around his neck, lay flat on his back, shut his eyes tight and sighed. That morning he had been on a beach in the Gulf of Mexico, watching naked Mavis masturbate. He had fucked an apple. He'd been to Atlantis. And now he was lying on a downy soft mattress in the home of the chief of all organised crime in America. If he closed his eyes, he might find himself back in the mad dog jail. He shook his head. There was nothing to fear. He heard the bedroom door open. There was nothing to fear. To prove it, he kept his eyes closed. He heard a board squeak. Squeaky boards in this place? Sure, to warn the sleeper that there was someone sneaking up on him. He opened his eyes. Tarantella Serpentine was standing over the bed. Bobby Baby sent me, she said.
He awoke in the dark, and his instinctive groping motion told him that Tarantella was gone. Instead, Mavis, in a white doctor's smock, stood at the foot of the bed, watching him with large, bright eyes. The darkened Drake bedroom had turned into a hospital ward, and was suddenly brightly lit. How did you get here? He blurted. I mean, how did I get here? So, she said kindly, it's almost all over. You've come through it. And suddenly he realized that he felt not twenty-three, but sixty-three years old. You've won, he admitted. I'm no longer sure who I am. You've won, Mavis contradicted. You've gone through ego loss, and now you're beginning to discover who you really are. Poor old Saul. He examined his hands. Old man's. Wrinkled. Goodman's hands. There are two forms of ego loss, Mavis went on, and the Illuminati are masters of both. One is schizophrenia, the other is illumination. They set you on the first track, and we switched you to the other. You had a time bomb in your head, but we diffused it. Malik's apartment, the Playboy Club, the submarine, and all the other past lives and lost years... By God, Saul Goodman cried. I've got it. I am Saul Goodman, but I am all the other people, too. And all time is this time, Mavis added softly. Saul sat upright, tears gleaming in his eyes. I've killed men. I've sent them to the electric chair seventeen times, seventeen suicides. The savages who cut off fingers or toes or ears for their gods are more sensible. We cut off whole egos, thinking they are not ourselves, but separate. Oh, God, God, God. And he burst into sobs. Mavis rushed forward and held him, cradling his head to her breast. Let it out, she said. Let it all out. It's not true unless it makes you laugh. But you don't understand until it makes you weep. Grew at the grey face. Saul screamed, weeping, beating his fist against the pillow as Mavis held his head, stroked his hair. Grew at the damned, and I have been his servant, his puppet, sacrificing myself on his electric altars as burnt offerings. Mavis cooed in his ear. Yes, yes, we must learn to give up our sacrifices, not our joys. They have taught us to give up everything except our sacrifices, and those are what we must give up. We must sacrifice our sacrifices. The gray face, the life-hater, soul shriek, the bastard motherfucker, Osiris Quetzalcoatl. I know him under all his aliases. Gray face, gray face, gray face. I know his wars and his prisons, the young boys he shafts up the ass, the George Dorns he tries to turn into killers like himself, and I have served him all my life. I have sacrificed men on his bloody pyramid. Let it out, Mavis repeated, holding the old man's trembling body. Let it all out, baby. The funny part... So sad, smiling, while a few tears still flowed. Is that I'm not ashamed of this. Two days ago, I would have rather died than be seen weeping, especially by a woman. Yes, Mavis said. Especially by a woman. That's it, isn't it? So gasped. That's their whole gimmick. I couldn't see you without seeing a woman. I couldn't see that editor Jackson without seeing a Negro. I couldn't see anybody without seeing the attached label and classification. That's how they keep us apart, Mavis said gently. And that's how they train us to keep our masks on. Love was the hardest bond for them to smash. So they had to create patriarchy, male supremacy, and all that crap. And the masculine protest and penis envy in women came in as a result. So even lovers couldn't look at one another without seeing a separate category. Oh, my God, my God, so man, beginning to weep heavily again. A rag, a bone, a hank of hair. Oh, my God. 
And you were with them, he cried suddenly, raising his head. You're a former Illuminatus. That's why you're so important to Hagbard's plan, and that's why you have that tattoo. I was one of the five who run the U.S. Avis nodded. One of the insiders, as Robert Welch calls them. I've been replaced now by Atlanta Hope, the leader of God's Lightning. I've got it, I've got it, so said laughing. I looked every way but the right way before. He's inside the Pentagon. That's why they built it in that shape, so he couldn't escape. The Aztecs, the Nazis, and now us. Yes, Mavis said grimly. That's why 30,000 Americans disappear every year without trace, and their cases end up in the unsolved files. He has to be fed. A man, though naked, may be in rags, so quoted. Ambrose Bierce knew about it. And Arthur Mackin, Mavis added. And Lovecraft. But they had to write in code. Even so, Lovecraft went too far, mentioning the Necronomicon by name. And that's why he died so suddenly when he was only forty-seven. And his literary executor, August de Leth, was persuaded to insert a note in every edition of Lovecraft's works, claiming that the Necronomicon doesn't exist and was just part of Lovecraft's fantasy. So asked... And the dolls, real, Avis said, all real. That's what causes bad acid trips and schizophrenia, psychic contact with them when the ego wall breaks. That's where the Illuminati was sending you when we raided their fake Playboy Club and short-circuited the process. Du Hexen Hasse, so quoted, and he began to tremble. Unheimlich! Ur, uh, Vater, whose art's uneven, horrid be thine aim. Harpoons in him, corpus whalem, take ye and hate. But on March the 31st, in that year of fruition for all the Illuminati's plans, while the President of the United States went on the air to threaten all-out thermonuclear heck, a young lady named Concepcion Galore lay nude on a bed in the Hotel Dorotti in Santa Isabel and said, Isha Loigor. What's a Loigor? asked her companion, an Englishman named Fission Chips, who had been born on Hiroshima Day and named by a father who cared more for physics than for the humanities. The room was in the luxury suite of the Hotel Dorotti, which meant that it was decorated in abominable Spanish Moorish decor. The sheets were changed daily to a less luxurious suite. The cockroaches were minimal, and the plumbing sometimes worked. Conathepion contemplated the bullfight mural on the opposite wall, Manoletti turning an elegant Ferranica on an unconvincingly drawn bull, and said thoughtfully, Ah. Oh. Eloigor is a god of the black people, the natives. A very bad god. Chips glanced at the statue again and said, more to himself than to the peasant girl, Looks vaguely like Tlaloc in Mexico City, crossed with one of those Polynesian Fafuru tikis. The starry wisdom people are very interested in these statues, Concepcion said just to be making conversation, since it was obvious that Chips wasn't going to be ready to prong her again for at least another half hour. Indeed. Chips said, equally bored. Who are the starry wisdom people? A church down on Tequilary Moto Street, what used to be La Mombo Street, and was Franco Street when I was a girl. Funny church. The girl frowned, thinking about them. When I worked in the telegraph office, I was always seeing the telegrams, all in cold and never to another church, always to banks, all over Europe and North and South America. You don't say. George Chips, no longer bored, but trying to sound casual. His code number in British intelligence was, of course, quadruple O five. Why are they interested in these statues? He was thinking that statues 
properly hollowed out, could transport heroin. He was already sure that starry wisdom was a front for bugger. You look like a robot, Joe Malik says in a warped room in a skewered time in San Francisco. I mean, you move and walk like a robot. Hold on to that, Mr. Wabbit, says a bearded young man with a saturnine smile. Some trippers see themselves as robots, others see the guide as a robot. Hold that perspective. Is it a hallucination or is it a recognition of something we usually black out? Wait, Joe says. Part of you is like a robot, but part of you is alive. Like a growing thing, a tree or a plant. The young man continues to smile, his face drifting above his body toward the mandala painted on the ceiling. Well, he asks, do you think that might be a good poetic shorthand? That part of me is mechanical, like a robot, and part of me is organic, like a rose bush? And what's the difference between the mechanical and the organic? Isn't a rose bush a kind of machine used by the DNA code to produce more rose bushes? <laughs> presidential order to take off for Fernando Poo. Atlanta Hope addresses a rally in Atlanta, Georgia, protesting the gutless appeasement of the ComSimp administration in not threatening to bomb Moscow and Peking at the same time as Santa Isabel. The Premier of Russia rereads his speech nervously as the TV cameras are set up in his office. And in socialist solidarity with the freedom-loving people of Fernando Pu. The chairman of the Chinese Communist Party, having found the thought of Chairman Mao of little avail, throws the I Ching sticks and looks dismally at hexagram 23. And 99% of the peoples of the world wait for their leaders to tell them what to do. But in Santa Isabel itself... Three locked doors across the suite from the now sleeping Concepcion. Fission chips, says angrily into his short wave. Repeat none. Not one Russian or Chinese anywhere on the bloody island. I don't care what Washington says. I'm telling you what I have seen. Now, about the bugger heroin ring here. Sign off, the submarine tells him. HQ is not interested in bugger or heroin right now. Damn blast! Chip stares at the shortwave set. That bloody well tore it. He would just have to proceed on his own and show those armchair agents back in London, especially that smug W, how little they actually knew about the real problem in Fernando Poo and the world. Storming, he charged back to the bedroom. I'll just get dressed, he thought furiously, including my smoke bombs and luger and laser ray and I'll toddle over to this starry wisdom church and see what I can nose out. But when he tore open the bedroom door, he stopped, momentarily stunned. Concepcion still lay in the bed, but she was no longer sleeping. Her throat was neatly cut, and a curious dagger with a flame design on it stuck into the pillow beside her. Damn blast and thunder, cried oh, 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 005. Now that absolutely does tear it. Every time I find a good piece of ash, those fuckers from Bugger come along and shaft her. Ten minutes later, the go signal came from the White House. A fleet of SAC bombers headed for Santa Isabel with hydrogen bombs and fission chips, fully dressed, toddled over to the Starry Wisdom Church, where he encountered not bugger, but something on an entirely different plane. Fernando Poo was given prominent attention in the world press only once before the notorious Fernando Poo incident. It occurred in the early 1970s, while Captain Tequila Emoto was first studying the art of the coup d'etat and laying his first plans, and was occasioned by the outrageous claims of the anthropologist J.N. Marsh of Miskatonic University 
that artifacts he had found on Fernando Poo proved the existence of the lost continent of Atlantis. Although Professor Marsh had an impeccable reputation for scholarly caution, and scientific rigour before this, his last published book, Atlantis and Its Gods, was greeted with mockery and derision by his professional colleagues, especially after his theories were picked up and sensationalised by the press. Many of the old man's friends, in fact, blame the campaign of ridicule for his disappearance a few months later, which they suspect was the suicide of a broken-hearted and sincere searcher after truth. Not only were Marsh's theories now beyond all scientific credibility, but his methods, such as quoting Allegro's The Sacred Mushroom and the Cross, or Graves the White Goddess, as if they were as reputable as Boaz, Mead or Fraser, seemed to indicate senility. This impression was increased by the eccentric dedication to Ezra Pound, Jacques de Molay, and Emperor Norton I. The real scientific scandal was not the theory of Atlantis, that was a bee that had haunted many a scholarly bonnet, but Marsh's claim that the gods of Atlantis actually existed, not as supernatural beings, of course, but as a superior class of life, now extinct, which had pre-existed mankind and duped the earliest civilization into worshipping them as divine and offering terrible sacrifices at their altars. That there was absolutely no archaeological or paleontological evidence that such beings ever existed was the mildest of the scholarly criticisms aimed at this hypothesis. Professor Marsh's rapid decline in the few months between the book's unanimous rejection by the learned world and his sudden disappearance caused great pain to colleagues at Miskatonic. Many recognised that he had acquired some of his notions from Dr. Henry Armitage, generally regarded as having gone somewhat bananas after too many years devoted to puzzling out the obscene metaphysics of the Necronomicon. When the librarian, Miss Horus, mentioned at a faculty tea shortly after the disappearance that Marsh had spent much of the past month with that volume, one Catholic professor urged, only half-jokingly, that Miskatonic should rid itself of scandals once and for all by presenting that damned book, he emphasised the word very deliberately, to Harvard. Missing Persons Department of the Arkham Police assigned the Marsh case to a young detective who had previously distinguished himself by tracing several missing infants to one of the particularly vile Satanist cults that have festered in that town since the witch-hunting days of 1692. His first act was to examine the manuscript on which the old man had been working since the completion of Atlantis and its gods. It seemed to be a shortish essay intended for an anthropological magazine and was quite conservative in tone and concept, as if the professor regretted the boldness of his previous speculations. Only one footnote expressing guarded and qualified endorsement of Urquhart's theory about whales being settled by survivors from Mu showed the bizarre preoccupations of the Atlantis book. However, the final sheet was not related to this article at all and seemed to be notes for a piece which the professor evidently intended to submit brazenly and in full and total contempt of academic opinion to a pulp publication devoted to flying saucers and occultism. The detective puzzled over these notes for a long time. The usual hoax, fiction presented as fact... This hoax described here, opposite to this, fact presented as fiction. Hoisman's La Bar started it, turns the Satanist into hero. Machen in Paris, 1880s, met with Hoisman's circle. Dolls and Aklo letters in Machen's subsequent fiction. Same years, Bierce and Chambers both mention Lake of Harley and Carcosa. Allegedly coincidence. 
Crowley recruiting his occult circle after 1900. Beers disappears in 1913. Lovecraft introduces Harley, Dolls, Aklo, Cthulhu after 1923. Lovecraft dies unexpectedly, 1937. Seabrook discusses Crowley, Macken, etc. in his Witchcraft, 1940. Seabrook suicide, 1942. Emphasize, Bierce describes Oedipus complex in Death of Help in Fraser before Freud and relativity in Inhabitant of Carcosa before Einstein. Lovecraft's ambiguous description of Azathoth as blind idiot god, demon sultan, and nuclear chaos, Kierkar 1930, 15 years before Hiroshima. Direct drug references in Chambers, King in Yellow, Macken's White Powder, Lovecraft's Beyond the Wall of Sleep and Mountains of Madness. The appetites of the Luigar or Old Ones in Bierce's Damned Thing, Macken's Black Stone, Lovecraft constantly. Atlantis, known as Fuel, or Tula both in German and Panama Indian law. And of course, coincidence again, the accepted explanation. Opening sentence for article. The more frequently one uses the word coincidence to explain bizarre happenings, the more obvious it becomes that one is not seeking, but evading the real explanation. Or shorter, the belief in coincidence is the prevalent superstition of the age of science.